وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعْجَبٌ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Ustaz Abdul Rahman Hassan, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Wa Alaikum Assalamu wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. We're back for another episode of the Hot Seat Podcast, inshallah. And uh, with it being towards the end of the year and towards the end of December, and us having quite a large audience from places like the UK, the US, we thought it would be important to do a topic on Christmas and New Year. However, we didn't want to restrict it to those two things because those two issues actually fall within a wider topic, which is known as imitating the disbelievers. And we're going to be talking a lot about that throughout the next couple of hours or so. And we're going to find out, inshallah, is it allowed for Muslims to do this? And if it is, then are there certain rules and regulations that Muslims must abide to and must abide by when doing this, inshallah. So we're going to talk about Christmas and New Year towards the end of the podcast. But for now, I just want to start with some introductory questions. And the first one I have for you really is what's the reason for picking this topic in the first place? Why is it even important to discuss? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Lahu alhamdul hasan wa thanaa ul jameel wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahadahu la sharika lah Yaqoolu alhaqqa wa huwa yahdi sabeel wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa attabi'ina lahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd I'm always grateful that you invite me over and Jazakallah khairan if I respond to your question there are many reasons why this topic is very important the first is if you look at the waqa of the Muslim in the reality of the Muslims today you find you'll see that the issue of imitating the non-Muslims is so high and so great a lot of Muslims are imitating the non-Muslims they are following the Christians the Jews the atheists social media has now become that place where you go to even if you want to you know do something if you want to dress in a certain way social media you you take it there's someone on on instagram or someone on twitter or someone on facebook who you'll take as a role model and you'll follow and they will set you guidelines of what to do and what not to do that's one yeah any important reason why i think this topic it, it needs it secondly it's to clarify the truth and what i mean by that is there has Uh, in any everything Allah has commanded subhanahu wa ta'ala there's always a people who go extreme in exaggeration and there's always people who are extreme in negligence there's always ifrat and tafrit and Islam always propagates encourages us to be in the middle path the middle path is what Allah and his messengers say it's not what you and I feel is the middle path mm-hmm. yani uh, someone could say for example there's a woman who's wearing يعني نقاب and everything and she's wearing jilbab and another woman is wearing a tra- trousers uh, and there's one who's wearing miniskirt the one says I'm wearing trousers I'm in the middle I'm you know mm-hmm. I'm the middle path I'm not extreme like the one who's wearing a miniskirt and I'm not extreme like the one who's wearing niqab and mm-hmm. she's jilbab and blacked out I'm in the middle I'm wearing trousers I'm still there now we say what is middle is set by who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger So everything Allah commands, there's always extreme exaggeration or extreme negligence. And mm-hmm. so you find a group of people when they talk about this issue of imitating the non-Muslims, they go extreme. And they sometimes prohibit what Allah has permitted for the people. Uh, so they say that this, you can't wear this, you can't do this, you can't do this. They go overboard in the concept of imitating the non-Muslims. And another group of people, they are extreme negligent. Uh, in this matter. They're careless. I mean, what, what's the problem? Why can't we imitate them? So I always like to bring the issue to that middle path, inshallah ta'ala, hoping that Allah ta'ala may allow me to clarify in, with evidences from the Quran and from the Sunnah. You see, uh, Islam as a religion, which is the third point, Islam as a religion has tried and exerted many efforts, our religion, An exert effort and encourages. This is let me use this word. Islam encourages 
for a person to be independent in his personality. Okay. It's very important. Islam wants the Muslim society to be very unique. They want to make the Muslims and independent from all other nations and all other groups in the Quran and the Sunnah. And in the seer of the Prophet you find that it's common, uh, bringing this personality out of a Muslim. And that a Muslim is not hamajun ra'a atba'i kulli na'iq, that he follows everybody he sees. For example, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Umar ibn al-Khattab reciting the Torah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear by the Lord, my soul is in his hand. لَقَدْ يَجِئْتُكُمْ بِهَا بَيْضَاءَ نَقِيَّةِ I have come with this religion clear. يعني it's a pure, clear religion. لَا تَسْأَلُهُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَيُخْبِرُكُمْ بِحَقٍ فَتُكَذِّبُوا بِهِ أَوْ بِبَاطِلٍ فَتُصَدِّقُوهُ بِهِ وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَوْ أَنَّ مُوسَى كَانَ فِيكُمْ حَيَّا مَا وَسِعَهُ إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَّبِعَنِي حتى موسى عليه السلام said If he was alive today and he was amongst us there would be no other path open for him except to follow me So that's Nabi Allahi Musa and Musa is from the five chosen prophets There are five prophets Allah chose They're called Ulul Azm min al-Rusul according to the strongest opinion and Allah mentions them subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hazab وَإِذَا خَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّنَ مِيثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى So those are the five chosen prophets. نَبِي اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدْ نَبِي اللَّهِ نُوحٍ وَمِنْكَ مِنْكَ means you, Muhammad. وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى Those five are the five chosen prophets. Isa is a five, one of the five chosen prophets. Musa is one of the five chosen prophets. Nuh is one of the five chosen prophets. Uh, Nabi Ibrahim is one of the five chosen prophets and Nabi Allahi Nuh alayhi salam Muhammad and a, a prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu salam so Musa if he was amongst us the prophet said there would be no other path open for him so the prophet was teaching Umar you have to be independent as a Muslim from following their scripture mm. you don't you stay away from that be a Muslim you have an identity you have you have a source to take your legislation from you have a source to take your clothing from you have a source where you can take from take from where you, you know, how you carry yourself and the way you act. Yeah. Okay. There's a couple of things I want to pick up from your answer. So the first is you mentioned as part of your answer that this is a reality that exists in the modern world that we live in. For example, social media, and we have people imitating the Jews, the Christians. My question is, is, is there a, a historical development back, like before our time? Is there a historical development to this kind of problem occurring? So this issue is not... Walidat Asrina. It's not something that just came about this time that we're seeing it. But rather it goes back to early stages. If you look back, when Israel, for example, asking from Nabi Allah Musa alayhi salam, speaking to Nabi Allah Musa, Musa, and they say to Musa alayhi salam, uh, you know, Allah mentions it in the Quran, Wajawazna bi Bani Israel al Bahra, Fatu ala kumi ya kufuna ala asnami lahum, Kalu ya Musa jalana ilah and kamalhum aliha, Kala in lakum kumun tajhalu. Musa alayhi salam, they said to him, Ij'allana ilahan kamaluhum aliha. Make an ilah for us like they have an ilah. In other words, Banu Israel are imitating who? Mutashabbihina. Amatashabbuhan bil mushrikeen. They are imitating the pagans. So you can see that this something, and it came very early. And then he said to them, Musa alayhi salam, Qala innakum qawmun tajhalun. You are nothing but ignorant people. He gave them that characteristics of jahal, which inshallah ta'ala we're going to revise Later, when we speak about some of the statements that the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned about mm -hmm. the, the imitating of the non-Muslims, where he referred to it, Ali Sallallahu Hadith Abi Dhar Al-Ghifari, we'll see that, inshallah ta'ala, in our podcast. Also, Quraysh, that you see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent, through, sent to Quraysh. Mm -hmm. You know, they were upon uh, the deen of Ibrahim Alaihi Salam, but a man came to them called Amr ibn Luhay. He went to Sham, where he saw in Sham amazed him and fascinated him. And then he came with an idol and he brought it to Quraysh. Yeah, Imam Ibn Kathir mentions it in his Kitab al-Bidayah wa Nihaya. Ibn Hisham mentions it in his Sirah that he saw when he went to Sham something. And he said, ما هذه الأصنام التي أراكم تعبدون? What is these idols? He said, Amr ibn Luhay. What are these idols in which you guys are worshipping? What is this? And they said to him, هذه أصنام نعبدها. These are idols which we worship. فَنَسْتَمْطِرُهَا We ask it for rain. فَتُمْطِرُنَا It brings rain down onto us. وَنَسْتَنْصِرُهَا We ask victory from these idols. فَتَنْصُرُنَا It gives us victory. فَقَالَ لَهُمْ He then said to them, أَلَا تُعْطُونِي مِنْهَا صَنَمًا Why don't you just give me an idol from 
within these idols. Asiru bihi ila ardi al-Arab. I take it to the land of the Arabs. Fayabudu, yani Quraysh and 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 Mac, Jazira al-Arab. I'll take it back to them, and and inshallah taala they will benefit from it. Fa'atuhu salaman yuqalu lahu hubal. So they gave him an idol which they call hubal. فقدم به مكة he brought it to مكة فنصبه he placed it in front of them وأمر الناس بعبادته وتعظيمه and then he told the people you know worship this idol and glorify it so this where did it come from it came to them from the mushrikeen a man who imitated the mushriks hmm. in other words in in reality Quraysh were were not upon this religion um, uh, they were upon a religion of you know يعني حنيفية the religion that Waraqat ibn Nawfal and there's a group of people who are known as the they were they were they were Hanifiyya. Hanifiyya means ma'ilun al shirki. They were far from shirk and they were upon tawheed. Waraqat ibn Nawfal and others. But this man Amr ibn Luhay, when he came back and he gave them this and he imitated the mushrikeen of that time, mm. he took it and he brought it to Quraysh, it made them misguided. So even the mushrikeen of Quraysh, who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was sent to mm. as a prophet, and we hear obviously Allah calling the mushrikeen, they actually only entered into that situation mm. because of a man who actually imitated mm-hmm. the other mushrikeen and brought it into their practices. And right that's now. the reason why they became misguided. Even our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at his time, when he saw the people imitating the non-Muslims of that time, he would go against them and, and do things to, different to them. You know, oppose them. Like Banu Israel, for example, the Yehud. When the Prophet moved to Medina, and the Yehud were, were his neighbors, uh, there were three tribes of the Yehud. Banu Quraidha, Banu Nadir, Banu Qaynuqa. All th- Banu Nadir and Banu Qaynuqa and Banu Quraidha. All three tribes of the Jews, they were neighboring. They were around the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, each broke their covenant with him, of course, and he fought them, alayhi salatu wasalam. Banu Nadir are mentioned in the Surah, Surah Al-Hashr is mentioned them, uh, where Allah wa ta'ala speaks about يُخْرِبُونَ بُيُوتَهُمْ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَيْدِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَاعْتَبِرُوا يَا أُولِي الْأَفْصَارِ مَا قَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ لِينَةٍ أَوْ تَرْكْتُمُهَا قَائِمَةً عَلَى وَصُولِهَا فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَلِيُخْنِ سَلْفَسِ Allah talks about them, subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا أَفَعَ اللَّهُ عَلَى رَسُولِي مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقُرَى يعني the قصة is there. The Prophet used to oppose them, alayhi salatu wasalam. He would go against them, alayhi salatu wasalam. And they, in everything, he would try to go against them. And the Yahud, they themselves said, مَا يُرِيدُ هَذَا الرَّجُلُ this man does not want an yad'a min amrina shay'an illa khalafana fi. That there's not a matter that except that this man wants to oppose us in it. And wants to do different to everything that we do. And this is specifically talking about nisa'ukum harthul lakum fa'atu harathakum anna shi'tum. You know, yas'alunaka alil bahid qul hu adhan fa'atazilun nisa'a fil mahid wa la taqrabuhunna hatta yadhurna fa'idha tatahrna fa'atuhunna min haythu amarakumullah. Yani it's talking about when the women are on menstruation the Jews, what they used to do is that when the woman is on menstruation, they would يعني, push her away. They would build her a tent, a little, a little hub, uh, and they would say to her, stay in there. And you're, you're not going to come close to anyone. And he, as though she's filth. Mm-hmm. And the Prophet sallallahu what did he say to the, what he, when his sahabas asked him, he said, uh, if alu, if alu shayt illa nikah, do everything to your wife except sexual intercourse. Mm-hmm. And then this is when they said, look, ma yuridu hadha rajul this man does not want a yada min amrina shay'an illa khalafana fi. Everything he wants to oppose us in it. So this shows us that this is something that was was there. Even the time of the Sahabas, Umar radiallahu anhu, when of course Islam spread and he went to lands. Now the Muslims are now yani, interacting with other communities, other other backgrounds, other people. Persia, you know, the Byzantine Empire is now being taken down. The Persian Empire is being taken down. Muslims are spreading. Sham, all these lands is being taken over. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he said to his workers and he said to the people of the land, Stay away from the clothing of the people, the disbelievers. And he don't wear their clothing. He's warning them from, from this. And that's the same problem that Umar was fearing was concerned about and had to send a letter and to remind the Muslims at that time is the same issue that we find the Muslims have fallen into today. The Muslims now go to the land of the disbelievers mm-hmm. and then when they went to the land of disbelievers, you find a person is so, yeah, and he resembles the non-Muslims. Like you wouldn't even know this person is a Muslim. And that's not right because the Muslim is sibghat Allah. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ سِبْغَةً وَنَحْنُ لَهُ عَابِدُونَ The mu'min is tamiz, at tamayyuz, he's distinct, distinct. Like when you say Muslim for far, 
That's a brother. You recognize him. And even when the colonies went to the lands of the Muslims and they colonized the lands of the Muslims, they, they, that's what they did. They tried their best to make them become like them mm. and act like them and, and be like them. And, and then when they left, they didn't leave. Mm. They left behind televisions. They brought corruptions in the lands of the Muslims. So even that though they, they, the armies and the, yeah, but they're still the, they still got the community and the society. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you. Uh, another thing I want to pick up. The second thing I want to pick up from your your first answer is you mentioned that Islam places a a big emphasis on having a distinct personality. Um, why does the religion of Islam feel so confident in and of itself to say that we don't need to follow anybody or anything? There are many things that Islam is distinct and unique in. Our religion, first of all, it is general. It's am. It's a general religion. It's not restricted to a time and a place. A religion is am. It's, it's it's for everybody. It's for Christians. It's Jews. Anyone coming to Islam. Allah Tabarak wa Taala He says to the Prophet, "Wa ma illa ka nasi bashiran wa nadira, walakin akthar nasi la yalamun." Allah says, "Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin." Allah says, "Tabarak al-ladhi nazzal al-furqan ala abdi liyakuna lil alamin nadira." Allah says, "Ya kul ya ayyuh al-nas, inni Rasul Allah ilaykum jamia al-ladhi lahu mulku samawat wa ard." لا إله إلا هو يحيي ويميت فآمنوا بالله ورسوله النبي الأمي الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته واتبعوه لعلكم تهتدون. Allah mentions in these verses that the Prophet was sent to every single وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين. He's a رحمة for all of the people. وما أرسلناك. We have not sent you. Allah is negating. So negation and then Allah mentions حرف استثناء except a mercy to all mankind. Also, mm-hmm. Allah says, "Illa kafatan lil nas." We send you to all of people. So, Nabi Allah Muhammad was sent for everybody. Sallallahu wa sallam alayhi. His da'wah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is not restricted to a place and a time, or it's not restricted to a nation from another nation. It's for everybody. The whole world, Islam, is meant to reach it. That's you know the second reason why our religion doesn't feels the rights to not want to follow anybody is because. Our religion is comprehensive in all matters of life. It solves its problems. Why would it need to copy uh, mm. a lifestyle that, that's incompetent? Allah says to the Prophet وسلم, and also the believers, Today I have completed your religion unto you and I have completed also my blessing upon you and I am pleased as Islam for your religion. Also Allah says, Who is the Prophet of the Messenger of the Lord and the Islam was sent down with guidance, which is beneficial knowledge. Who is the Prophet of Allah? With the knowledge, meaning the knowledge of the truth. And the truth of the means the work of the Prophet to show it to the whole religion. So it's apparent upon all religions. Islam is a religion where it's dominant over everything. The third reason why Islam, our religion, the Unity Islam, doesn't require to 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 follow anyone or anything is because it abrogated every every religion that came before it. All the prophets that came, their legislations and what they came with, is abrogated by, with what Nabi Muhammad came with, alayhi salatu wasalam, wa muhaymin an alayhi, yani, abrogator over everything. So, it didn't just abrogate what the previous prophets came with, but it abrogated all other ways of life. And if this Quran abrogated the Torah and the Injil and the Zabur and all of those religions, how would it not dismiss and ignore? Man-made laws. These are, by the way, Torah is what Allah said. Subhanahu wa taala. Allah read the Torah with His own hand. Subhanahu wa taala. Injil and Zabur. These are abrogated, and these are legislations once upon a time that were from from Allah Subhanahu wa taala. How would it not uh, dismiss and ignore mm-hmm. man-made law by humans? So this religion is 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 is, to, is here to guide the people to take them out of the darkness. Allah says in the Quran, Ya Ya Ahl Al Kitabi. قد جاءكم رسولنا يبين لكم كثيرا مما كنتم تخفون من الكتاب ويعفو عن كثير قد جاءكم من الله نور وكتاب مبين يهدي به الله من اتبع رضوانه سبل السلام ويخرجهم من الظلمات إلى النور بإذنه ويهديهم إلى صراط مستقيم يعني نبي الله محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم through this legislation was he doing يبين لكم كثيرا he clarifies for you many things in which the Jews and the Christians used to hide once upon a time from the people Also, this will, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Qad jaa'akum min Allahi nurun." The Prophet has come with light, wa kitabu mubin. Yahdi bihi Allahu man ittaba'a ridwanahu subul salam. 
And anyone who follows it is on a path that's blessing and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through this religion, Allah will take the people of da- out of darknesses and bring them to light, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he guides subhanahu wa ta'ala to what? To that which is the straight path. So this religion, that is why it is uh, uh, one that doesn't need to and doesn't have to um, adhere to any other laws or okay. regulations. Okay, my final question before from the introductory questions before we get into a bit more of a discussion, inshallah, is are there any books that have been written on this topic, maybe for the advanced students of knowledge to benefit from? There are many rasail, uh, kutubs even written on it. Like one of the like in the one of the greatest books that are written is the Kitab Iqtidaw Sirat al Mustaqim ni Mukhalifat Ashab al Jahim by Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, ibn Taymiyyah, this Kitab of his Iqtidaw Sirat al Mustaqim, it's actually considered to be one of the most comprehensive, one of the most strongest books. Uh, ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, clarified the position a Muslim should take when it comes to imitating the non Muslims. He brings many ayats. He brings a hadith from the Prophet. ﷺ. He brings unanimous agreements, ijma'at, he brings rahimahullah ta'ala. He talks about the types of tashabbuh there are. He talks about the bad consequences that tashabbuh have. He focuses and he talks about ayad al mushrikeen and celebrating the non Muslims' festivals and their celebrations and participating in it. He also talks about issues related to bid'ah, innovations, and khurafat, myths in which Muslims do in their celebrations and their festivals. It was also summarized by Sheikh Muhammad uh, Ali ibn Muhammad al-Ba'li al-Hanbali with the tahqiq of Sheikh Ali ibn uh, Muhammad al-Imran Dar al-Alim al-Fawaid he called al-mahaj, al-manhaj al-qawim fi ikhtisari iqtidaa sarat al-mustaqim it's a summarized version if you can't read the full version you can always go back to the summarized version and the best taba'a of the iqtidaa sarat al-mustaqim so far is the taba'a of Sheikh uh, Nasir Abdul Karim al-Aql Dar al-Asima published it before that Muhammad Hamid al-Fiqhi published it and he, and he worked on it. He placed a content page and everything, etc. Mm-hmm. But there's many mistakes in it. Also, there's a kitab called Tashabbuh al Khasis bi Ahl al Khamis. And that is a kitab written by Imam al Dhahbi, who died in 748 Hijriah. This kitab is called Tashabbuh. And some copies fell into a mistake, like Bashar Awad Ma'roof and others. They call it Tashbih al Khasis. Mm-hmm. And it's not right to call it tashbih. Uh, grammatically, it's better to call it tashabuh. I won't go into that now. Al tashabuh al khasis. Al khasis is ba'ani ahlun nasara. He means bi ahli al khamis because the Christians they believed in something known as al khamis al sughra and al khamis al kubra, okay. which they used to celebrate. So this is is very good. It's very beneficial. There's a tabaa and the tahqiq I have is dar al dar al dar ammar dar ammar. With the tahqiq of Sheikh uh, Ali uh, Hassan al Halabi, Rahimahullah Rahmatan Wasi'ah. Also, there's a risala written by uh, Ibn uh, Hajar al Asqalani, who died in 852 Hijriya. He called it Al Qawlu Thabt, Fisom Yom Sabt. And this kitab is Min al Kitab al Mafqood. It's not actually published. We only know about it because half of the Hajar mentions it in his Fatul Bari. Mm. He says, Waqad Jama'atu al Masail al Lati Waradat. الحديث فيها بمخالفة أهل الكتاب فزاد على ثلاثين حكما وقد أودعتها كتابي الذي سميته القول الثبت في الصوم يوم السبت سيز. So he says, I've, this issue of تشابه بالكفار, I've يعني collected the ahadith related to it, uh, and I he mentions that there's thirty ahkam related to this whole issue, and he said all of this and other points I've written it in my book القول الثبت في الصوم يوم السبت. Also there's a kitab called Husn uh, al-Tanbih I'm sorry Husn al-Tanabuh fi ma warada fi at-tashabbuh written by Najm al-Din al-Ghazi al-Shafi'i when it first came out was 2012 I, I remember buying it then the Islamic calendar is 1432 Hijriya he passed away 1061 Hijriya um, and it's 12 volumes Daru Nawadir published it it's a very, very good copy this one is the biggest, biggest book in terms of quantity and the topic. It's like a mawsu'ah, it's an encyclopedia on this issue of tashabbu bil kufar imitating the non-Muslims. He divided the whole book into two categories, and he divided the book into two. The first part he talks about, al-amru uh, bil-tashabbuhi bihim, the commandments that have come regarding imitating the non-Muslims, and imitating the angels. He talks about imitating the righteous people, imitating the martyrs, imitating the prophets, and 
يعني imitating the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in his mannerism and he talks about the the tashabbuh we were commanded to do. Okay. The second part he talks about the 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 the, the tashabbuh which we were prohibited from, like tashabbuh of the shaytan and tashabbuh of the previous nations. And then he speaks about each prophet like قوم نوح, عاد, ثمود, نمرود, قوم لوط, يعني شعيب, فرعون, until he finishes. The book. He, then he talks about imitating the fusaq, the transgressors and the wrongdoers and the innovators and etc. Also, Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah, in his kitab, Hijab al-Mar'at al-Muslima, Majil Bab al-Mar'at al-Muslima, first of all, he called it Hijab al-Mar'at al-Muslima, Shaykh al-Albani, and then he changed it into Jilbab al-Mar'at al-Muslima, which we had our podcast on the niqab. Yes, right. Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah, when he talks about the, 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 the conditions, the shurut of the hijab, or the shurut of the jilbab, One of the conditions is he mentions that it doesn't resemble the uh, the clothing of the non-Muslim, mm. right? He mentions that, that yeah, was one did, of his yeah, conditions. Yeah. So in there, Sheikh Al-Albani, each condition, by the way, he explains it. He explains it. When it comes to the uh, the tashabbub al-kufar, he mentions 31 hadith. So he, it's also... Wow. It's also uh, There's another kitab, a final kitab I want to mention, is the kitab Masail al-Jahiliyyah. التي خالف فيها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن الجاهلية and it's written by Sheikh Al-Islam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab رحمه الله تعالى Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab mentions 128 things in which the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم يعني went against the أهل الجاهلية this term أهل الجاهلية as if I can just quickly just speak okay. about it this term أهل الجاهلية the word جاهلية is the opposite of uh, I mean the word جاهلية comes from the word الجهل ignorance And the opposite of ignorance is, of course, knowledge, right? Al yeah. And al-jahl, the scholars, they categorize it into two in terms of its يعني, meaning. There's like jahl, which is murakkab, compounded ignorance. And there is يعني, jahl, which is basit, simple ignorance. يعني, jahl, which is basit, is the one when the person says, oh, yo, I don't know this. It's adam al-idraki bil kulliya. It's when the, person doesn't say, when the person says to you, I don't know this at all. That's called jahl, which is basit. Jahl, which is murakkab, is... تصور الشيء على وجه يخالف ما هو عليه. It is to perceive something in a way that it really isn't, but then you think you know it. Right, right. It's yes. compounded because it's hard to take that ignorance yeah. away from a person. And um, it's powerful. Muhammad Abdul Hab used that word. You know, he called it مسائل الجاهلية. Because remember what we mentioned. وجاوزنا ببني إسرائيل البحر فأتوا على قوم يعكفون على أصنام لهم. قالوا يا موسى جعل لنا إلها كما لهم آلهة. قال إنكم قوم Tajhalun. Remember, he said, "Yo, right, yeah, Tajhalun." Yeah. So, the word jahiliya comes in the Quran many places. Allah used it Subhanahu wa Taala for hukm al jahiliya yabghuniya. If jala al ladina fi qulubihim al hamiya, hamiya al jahiliya, fi anzal Allahu sakina ta ala rasuli wa ala al muminina. يعني إذ جعل الذين في قلوبهم الحمية حمية الجاهلية. الجاهلية was used in that. يظنون بالله غير الحق ظن الجاهلية. وقرن في بيوت كنا ولا تبرجنا تبرج الجاهلية الأولى. Also when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said to Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, عيّرته بأمي. I Abu Abu Dhar said something unpleasant to Bilal ibn Rabah. And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, عيّرته بأمي. Are you are you are you faulting him? Are you insulting him because of his mother? And then the Prophet said to Abu Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, إن إنك مرؤ فيك جاهلية. You are a person who has jahiliyyah in him. Bukhari and Muslim both narrated that. Also, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi used that word. He said, "Man kharaja an taati, wa farak al jamaa, wa mata, famiitatuhu mita tun jahiliyas." Prophet said, "Anyone who leaves the obedience of the Muslim leader and goes against the Muslim unity and then dies for verily his death is the death of jahiliyyah." Muslim narrated that. Okay. The jahiliyyah is two types, and I'm going to conclude with this point. The jahiliyyah is two types. This jahiliya, which is عام, a general type of jahiliya, and that is التي كان قبل بعثة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. And before the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came out, we refer to that time as jahiliya. We call this jahiliya, mm-hmm. يعني the time of the jahiliya. It's the one Allah mentions in Surah Al-Jumu'ah. هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسول منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين. Mm-hmm. That was a jahiliya before Islam. And then there's jahiliya, which is al-juziyya. Jahiliya, da, jah, uh, the jahiliya, al jahiliya to juziya means that jahiliya is restricted to places and times and regions. Not necessarily the entire people don't have it. Okay. As Allah mentions, "Yaalamuna zahira min al hayat al dunya wa hum anil akhirat hum ghafilun yo." Wa laqad zara'na li jannah ma kathira min al jinn. 
من الجن والإنس لهم قلوب لا يفقهون بها ولهم أعين لا يبصرون بها ولهم آذان لا يسمعون بها أولئك كالأنعام بل هم أضل أولئك هم الغافلون أم تحسب أن أكثرهم يسمعون أو يعقلون إنهم إلا كالأنعام بل هم أضل, أضل السبيل And these are ignorant people They're like the cattles Their jahiliya is restricted As the poet said أبو نية إن من الرجال بهيمة في صورة الرجل السميع المبصر فطن بكل رزية في ماله وإذا أصيب بدينه لم يشعر It's a person who has knowledge of the worldly affairs يعلمون ظاهرة من الحياة الدنيا He knows the worldly affairs Mastered it But he's jahil and he's ignorant when it comes to his religion And the issues related uh, related to that So the point I want to mention from this is jahiliya We have to understand it There's two types of jahiliya Jahiliya which is amma and is jahili which is al juziya and that's why Muhammad Abdul Wahab when he wrote the kitab Masail al Jahiliya he is uh, discussing this issue that we mentioned okay um, okay let's go into the issue a little bit more detail then um, and as always I like to start with definitions so we're talking about imitating the the non Muslims imitating the kuffar what exactly does imitation mean generally when it comes to def- definition of words I I think it's very important that we understand the definitions of words, we have to take it back to Kutub al-Qawamis, yani ma'ajim, yani dictionaries mm-hmm. and books like that. And one of the greatest books that I encourage students of knowledge to look back to, and it's a very beneficial qamus, is Mu'jam Maqayis al by Ibn Faris. Ibn Faris' kitab, the benefit about it is that if a word has many usages, mm-hmm. it's got many usages, Yeah. what he does is that he looks for the bare minimum in which he can bottle it down to. So if we've got a word, it's got many usages He yeah. tries to find One Common Something that's common With all the different for, types of usages Yeah okay. Just to narrow it down For the person One, okay, two, three He does that Which is very beneficial Kitab for that perspective Yeah He d- uh, Abul Hussein Ahmed ibn Faris Ibn Zakaria He spoke about the word at And he said at Min Shabaha It comes from the word Shabaha Which is Ashin Walba Walha and he says, Aslun Wahidun. It's just one, it goes back to one word now. Yadulu ala tashabuhi shay wa tashakulihi lawnan wasfa. It means when something resembles something in its form, the color, the description. Yuqalu shibhun wa shabahu. That's what you say. It's something resembling something. It's okay. something looking like something. That's what it means in the, uh, uh, in the linguistic meaning. Mm-hmm. As for the technical meaning, it means resemble. So, sorry, by, by technical, you mean how Islam uses it, how the Sharia, yeah, uses, the Sharia it. uses it. Okay. In the Sharia, there are many scholars who defined it. They gave it many different, de- de- many different definitions. Al Munawi has a definition. Abdul Rauf Al Munawi, Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymi gave a different definition. The author of the Kitab Al Husn Al Tanabbuh, Najmuddin Al Ghazi Al Shafi'i, he also mentions the definition. But the the the, the, the definition goes back to resembling. The non-Muslims in their aqidah, in their ibadat, in their akhlaq, and in their adat. Four things you mentioned. So four things. In their aqidah, what they believe. Okay. In their ibadat, acts of worship that they mm-hmm. do. Al-akhlaq, in their mannerism. And their adat, their norms. Inshallah ta'ala, we will, we, we, we will unpackage each point. Uh, and, you know, what each one is. Are they all the same in levels? How do you divide uh, Is the i'tiqad and the ibadat And akhlaq and adat All the same mm-hmm. Inshallah ta'ala uh, Okay I'm hoping that we can Unpackage it in the, in the podcast now. Okay and when we say um, Imitation And we're obviously talking About how you mentioned At the start That Islam has its own Wants its own distinct Unique uh, Like mannerisms Or whatever you want to call it Personality if you want to say um, Which kind of implies That it's wrong or it's bad to imitate the, the non-Muslims, does that mean it's wrong to imitate them in everything or are there types of imitation? So, this is very important. The tashabbu of the, of the kufar is two types. Okay. I mean, the tashabbu generally, not just the kufar, but it's generally the tashabbu in the sharia is two types. Mm. There's tashabbu which is al manhiyu anhu, which is mamnu'ah. It's known as the tashabbu which is mamnu'ah. You're not allowed to. Okay, so it's haram. Yeah, yeah, haram. And the second one, which is a tashabu, which is mubah, you're allowed to. Okay. If I start with the one that's prohibited, there are I any mean, few of them. It goes back to four, the ones that the Sharia prohibits. It goes back to three, four, four, four. And if somebody, inshallah ta'ala, watches it and adds more to it, walillahi wal minna. But I've narrowed it down to those four. The first one is 
التشبه بالبهائم imitating the animals mm-hmm. the second one is uh, imitating uh, الشيطان التشبه yeah. بالشيطان which is the second the third one is التشبه الرجال بالنساء men imitating the women and the women imitating men and the fourth one is uh, تشبه المسلمين بغيره من الأمم the Muslims are imitating other nations like the Christians and the Jews and the Zoroastrians and Ahlul Jahiliya pre-Islamic okay. Uh, ignorance those four are the types which are prohibited if I go through each one for example the cattle I mean the haywanat as you know as Muslims we believe that humans are being honored Allah honored us as humans Allah mentions in the Quran وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ Allah says we have honored the humans Allah honored us subhanahu wa ta'ala and he honored us in many ways the, one of the ways that Allah has honored us is we're able to you know articulate ourselves We're also able to think. We have aql. We have rational. These are things Allah has honored us with, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says, Ar-Rahman, in there Allah mentions what? Allamahu al-bayan, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The ability to articulate our points and say what we want. If you look at the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the animals and the cattle, He mentions it in maqam al-dham, and in places where He's putting it down. Allah says, فَمَثَلُوا كَمَثَلِ الْكَلْبِ إِن تَحْمِلْ عَلَيْهِ يَلْهَدْ أَوْ تَتْرُكُوا يَلْهَدْ ذلك مثل القوم الذين كذبوا بآياتنا. So Allah mentions the dog and he gives a resemblance to the disbelievers in that regard. Allah says مثل الذين حملوا التوراة ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا بئس مثل القوم الذين كذبوا بآيات الله. Allah also ولقد ذرأنا لجهنم كثيرا من الجن والإنس لهم قلوب لا يفقهون لا يفقهون بها ولهم أعين لا يبصرون بها ولهم ولهم آذان لا يسمعون بها أولئك كالأنعام بل هم أضل أولئك هم الغافلون وصل الله سيز والذين كفروا يتمتعون ويأكلون كما تأكل الأنعام والنار مثوى لهم So when you look at the cattle generally speaking Allah تبارك وتعالى He talks, it, talks about it in that regard And then there's specific animals Allah has mentioned سبحانه وتعالى Oh sorry the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has mentioned specifically these animals He mentions that they are يعني ones that we shouldn't follow Like for example stretching out the forearm Uh, when the person is uh, in the middle of the prayer in mm-hmm. sujood hadith al imam al bukhari and abu dawood and tirmidhi and nasa and ibn majah narrated in hadith anas ibn malik that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said i'tadilu yani be straight fi sujood whilst in your prostration wa la yabsut ahadukum dhira'ayhi in bisat al kalbi do not stretch out your forearms like the way the dog does mm-hmm. also the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he prohibited us from squatting like a dog iqa al kalb Abi Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Amarani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet commanded me bithalathin. He commanded me three. Wa nahani and he prohibited me from three. Wa fihi nahani an iqa'i ka iqa'i al-kalbi. And from what he prohibited me from was the uh, to squat like a dog. And Imam Ahmad narrated this in his Musnad and Ibn Majah on the authority of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Also not to imitate the camel. And Imam Ahmad and Abu Dawood and Nasai narrated it. And Hafiz ibn Hajar in his kitab Bulu al-Maram, he said, أخرجه, أخرجه ثلاثة, that the famous hadith Abu Huraira narrated, إذا سجد أحدكم فلا يبرك كما يبرك البعير وليضع يديه قبل ركبتيه. And if a person wants to go down on his, يعني go down to sujood from, from, from coming up from the ruku' the person will come up from the ruku' yeah. and they stood up, they want to go to the sujood, right? The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said, do not go down on your On your knees. Let me don't go down like the camel, sorry. So what should you do? Well, يَضَعَ يَدَيْهِ Place your hands first. قَبْلَ رُكْبَتَيْهِ Before your knees. That last part of the hadith, there's a long discussion regarding yeah. it. Is it maqloob? Is it uh, back and forth? Mm-hmm. And his scholars, Ibn al-Qayyim, has a view in Zad al-Ma'ad. Uh, and يعني, that's... It's not for this podcast right now. We're not going to discuss it. Even yeah. though I'm not of the view of Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, I don't think he's... He got the correct view in this issue. Okay. Also, the third thing that we're prohibited, specifically from the animals, is the ghurab. We're not, we're not prohib- we're prohibited from the crow, for example. Pecking like a crow. The Prophet ﷺ, the Hadith Ahmed and Abu Dawood and Nasa'i and Ibn Majah narrated in Darimi, in Hadith Abdullah ibn Shiblin, he said, Naha Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم عن نقرة الغرابي. The Prophet prohibited us from the pecking like a, a crow. Also, the, the pecking of the, 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 the,
The Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from it. وَلَهَارِ عَنْ نَقْرَةِ كَنَقْرَةِ الدِّيكِ Ahmad narrated in his Muslim in Hadith Abi Hurairah. Also, we're not allowed to be like the fox, for example, looking around and stuff like that whilst in the prayer. Okay. Abu Hurairah narrated that when a hani wal tifati kal tifati thalabi Ahmad narrated in the Musnad. Yani, this is the first type, which is the animals. The okay. second okay. type is men imitating women and women imitating men. Mm-hmm. You know the famous hadith Ahmad narrated in Hakim and Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and Darimi. In hadith Abi Hurairah, la'ana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ar-rajula, the Prophet cursed a man. Yalbasu lipsat al-mar'ati. He wears the clothing of the women. Wal-mar'ata talbasu lipsat al-rajuli. And a woman who wears the clothing of men. Abdullah ibn Abbas also narrated he said la'an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-mukhannithina the Prophet cursed the mukhannithin min al-rijal wal mutarajilati min al-nisa men who you know dress like women who act like women and women who act like men the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said akhrijuhum min buyutukum take these people out of your houses qala fa'akhraj al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fulanan wa akhraj umaru fulanan Muhammad narrated this Bukhari and Abu Dawud and Tirmidhi so Men are not allowed to imitate women and women are not allowed to imitate men. Also, Ahmad narrated in Tabarani. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said, Sami'atu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Laysa minna man tashabbah bil rijali. He's not from amongst us, the one who imitates men. Sorry, the men, sorry, that imitate. Laysa minna man tashabbah bil rijali min al-nisa. The men that imitate women. Wala man tashabbah bil nisa min al-rijal. And the women that imitate men. Okay. Yeah. The third prohibited one is a shaytan. Mm. Allah says inna shaytana lakum aduwan fattakhidhuhu aduwa inna ma yad'u hizbahu liyakunu min ashabi as-sa'ir we were told to take shaytan as an enemy we can't resemble we can't yeah. want to be like him of course Allah also says qala fa bima aghwaytani la aq'udanna lahum siratakal mustaqim thumma la atiyannahum min bayni aydihim wa min khalfihim wa an aymanihim wa an shama'irihim wa la tajidu aktharahum aktharuhum shakirin wa la tajidu aktharahum shakirin shaytan made a promise he said, Qala fabima agwaitani because oh Allah you misguided me. Lak udana lahum sirata kal mustaqim. I'm gonna sit in front of them in the sirat al mustaqim. So malaatiyanu min bayni aidim wa min khalfim wa an aymanim. I'm gonna come to them from all directions. Wala tajidu akhtarahum shakirin. And the majority of them you're not gonna find them thankful. Allah says in another ayah, Wala udilla nahum wala un wala umaniya nahum wala amuranahum fala yubati kunna adana al anami wala amuranahum fala yugayiruna khalkallah. وَمَنْ يَتَّخِذِ الشَّيْطَانَ وَمَنْ يَتَّخِذِ الشَّيْطَانَ وَلِيَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ خَسِرَ خُسْرَانًا مُبِينًا يَعِيدُهُمْ وَيُمَنِّيهِمْ وَمَا يَعِيدُهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا يعني he wants to misguide them, give them false delusions. Allah mentions subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after that Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَّخِذِ الشَّيْطَانَ وَلِيَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Anyone who takes shaytan as an ally from Allah, فَقَدْ خَسِرَ خُسْرَانًا مُبِينًا Before that Allah says, فَلَا يُغَيِّرُنَّ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ He will try to make you change the way Allah created you, which we'll speak about later. He okay. takes methods. Also, there is something that I generally see in circles of knowledge that people generally tend to do, which is that when they come into circle of knowledge, as they sit down and they're listening, they all scatter around. Mm, yeah. They don't come together, united. Yeah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in a hadith, Ahmed narrated Abu Dawood and Ibn Habban and Bayhaqi and Isnadu Mutasin and Sahih and Inshallah Ta'ala, in hadith Ta'alabat al Khushani, Radiallahu Ta'ala, anhu, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to the companions and each one went under a tree because these people were looking for shades. Right, yeah, I see. Yeah. I don't understand why people do it in masjids, but yeah. Sahabas did it because of shades. That whenever they see a shade, they'll sit there. Another one sees a shade over there, he'll sit there. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said to them, Inna tafarruqakum fi hadihi shi'abi wal awdiya. You disperse like this and scattered all over the place in this valley. The Prophet said, Inna madalikum inna shaytan. This is only from shaytan. The Sahabat radiallahu anhum, the narrator mentions, فَلَمْ يَزَلْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ After that day when the Prophet said that, the Sahabas, they became all together, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Yeah. They all came together. And the narrator went, say, he said, لَوْ بُسِطَ عَلَيْهِمْ If a garment was يعني, spread out and it was thrown over them, it would take them all. That's yeah. how tightly close they were. So if someone might be doing that and not knowing that they're actually imitating the shaytan. Imitating the shaytan. Uh, if someone has like a health issue and they need to sit by a wall, is that okay for them to do? Like yeah, the definitely. Back of the masjid, yeah, okay. definitely. There's another thing that's commonly done by people as well, which is imitating shaytan as well, which is hadith Abu Huraira narrated, radiallahu ta'ala anhu marfu'an, hadith fi sahih Muslim, the Prophet said, المؤمن القوي خير أحب إلى الله من المؤمن الضعيف, that the strong believer is more beloved to Allah than the weak one. Then the Prophet said, وَفِي كُلِّنْ خَيْرٍ All of them, inshallah, have good in them. Then the Prophet said a powerful statement, which I say that if you are looking for the benefit, personal development, this is it. This is It's just in this one okay. sentence. اِحْرِسْ عَلَى مَا يَنْفَعُكَ وَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا تَعْجَزْ Strive to what will benefit you. Hmm. Rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't give up. Hmm. 
Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a powerful point that I want from it. وَإِنْ أَصَابَكَ شَيْءٌ فَلَا تَقُلْ If a matter a calamity befalls you, فَلَا تَقُلْ Don't say, لَوْ أَنِّي فَعَلْتُ كَذَا كَانَ كَذَا وَكَذَا If I was to do this, 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 it would have been this. وَلَكِنْ say قَدَّرَ اللَّهِ Allah has destined وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ Just say, whenever something befalls you, a calamity, something happens to you, just say, قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ Whatever Allah willed happen. Mm. Then the Prophet said, فَإِنَّ لَوْ If you say, if, تَفْتَحُ عَمَلَ الشَّيْطَانِ This opens the doors wow. of shaitan, which a lot of people do. They're imitating yeah. the shaitan by doing that. Also, the Prophet ﷺ told us to eat. He said, إِذَا أَكَلْ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَأْكُلْ بِيَمِينِ If you're going to eat, eat with your right. وَإِذَا شَرِبَ فَلْيَشْرَبْ بِيَمِينِ If you're going to drink, drink with your with your right. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَأْكُلُ بِشِمَالِ وَيَشْرَبُ بِشِمَالِ Because shaitan eats with his left and he drinks with his left. Uh, Muslim narrated this in his Sahih. Okay. So, as for the hadith that the people mention, الْأَنَاتُ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَالْعَجَلَةُ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ Like, Diligence is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hastiness is from shaitan. Then this hadith that Imam Tirmidhi narrated it and it's weak because of the narrator in there, Abdul Muhammad ibn Abbas. It's weak. Tirmidhi, he said, many scholars have spoken about him. And Imam al Bukhari said, Munkar al Hadith and Nasa'i said, Laysa bi tiqatin, Daru Qutni said, Laysa bil qawi. Half of the Hajjah, he said, Daif. Yani, being calm is from Allah and hastiness is from, from shaitan. The meaning might be right, mm-hmm. but to attribute it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is wrong. The last example uh, hadith I want to mention regarding imitating shaitan, I think this was very important for okay, me, fine. is the hadith of Mutarrif ibn Abdullah al-Shakhir. He said, Qala Abi, my father said, Abdullah ibn al-Shakhir, he said, in talaqtu fi wafti bani amirin. I went out in a delegation of bani amirin to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Faqulna, we said, we went with this delegation to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we said, Anta Sayyiduna, you are our master, O Prophet of Allah. Anta Sayyiduna, you are our master. Faqala the Prophet said, As-Sayyidullah, the master is Allah. فقلنا then we said وأفضلنا فضلا you are the most virtuous one amongst us وعظمنا طولا you have the highest and greatest position of Messenger of Allah then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said قولوا بقولكم أو بعض قولكم ولا يستجرينكم الشيطان the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say some of that which you were saying or the speech that you were saying before say that mm. ولا يستجرينكم الشيطان and do not let shaitan slip you and Imam Abu Dawood narrated this and in Sinad inshallah is متصل all of the rijala are Insha'Allah ta'ala thiqat, as an Imam Abu Dawood himself mentioned. So this is the tashabbuh of shaitan. Then the last one is the tashabbuh bil kuffar, imitating the... Which is really what our podcast is going to yeah, be. This about. is what our podcast is. This is the fourth one, which is a okay. prohibited one. And this is from the tashabbuh, which is mamnur, is prohibited. There are many ayahs that have come regarding it. There's many ahadith that have come uh, regarding it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَفْرَحُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمِنَ الْأَحْزَابِ مَنْ يُنْكِرُ بَعْضَهُ قُلْ إِنَّمَا أُمِرْتُ أَنَا عَبُدَ اللَّهَ وَلَا أُشْرِكَ بِهِ إِلَيْهِ أَدْعُوْ وَإِلَيْهِ مَآبْ وَكَذَلِكَ أَنْزَلَاهُ حُكْمًا عَرَبِيًّا وَلَئِنِ اتَّبَعْتَ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ بَعْدَ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ مَا لَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيِّ وَلَا وَاقَ The last part of the ayah is what concerns me which is وَلَئِنِ اتَّبَعْتَ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ Muhammad if you follow these people's path بَعْدَ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ also Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala he says وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحُكْمُ وَالنُّبُوَةِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ وَآتَيْنَاهُمْ بَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ فَمَا اخْتَلَفُوا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمُ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ يَقْضِي بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فِيمَا كَانُوا فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ then Allah says ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ that part where Allah says ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا we have made you upon a legislation فَاتَّبِعْهَا follow it وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ and before that Allah mentions وَلَقَدْ آتِينَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَةَ we gave them all of that وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ we gave them so many things but Allah is telling Muhammad you we've placed you upon a legislation you have a path also Allah says in another ayah أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدُ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Here Allah mentions وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ I do not be like the people of the scripture before you Okay. Don't be like them. Allah is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's companions, He says, Ya Ayyuhaladina Amanu, those of you who believe, La taqulu ra'ina. Don't use this word ra'ina. Waqulu dhurna, say, look, wasma'u and listen. Walil kafirin adabun alim. Hafidh Nuhajarin mentions Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He says, Nahallahu Ta'ala al-Mu'minina, 
أن يتشبهوا بالكفار في مقالهم وفي عالهم وذلك أن اليهود كانوا يعانون من الكلام ما فيه تورية لما يقصدونه من التنقيص عليهم لعائن الله فإذا أرادوا أن يقولوا اسمع لنا قالوا راعنا The Prophet Ibn Hajar Ibn Kathir mentions that Allah prohibited the believers to imitate the disbelievers in their statements and in their actions because the, the Jews, they used to use words where they sometimes play play with it. Right. They would say to the Prophet وسلم, and their intent is they refer to they're using the word that's the word that they intend which is to put belittle the Prophet ﷺ and put him down. So the Prophet ﷺ, after they, they would come and they would use that word, the Sahabas were told, don't use it. Because they're using it and mm. they're trying to belittle the Prophet ﷺ. Just, just stay away from them. Allah also says, وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ قُلْ إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهِ هُوَ لَهُدَى وَلَئِنِ اتَّبَعْتَ أَهْوَاهُمْ بَعْدَ الَّذِي جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ مَا لَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ Allah says, if you follow, and first of all, the Christians and the Jews will never be pleased with you until you follow their religion. And then Allah wa ta'ala said to Muhammad, Qul say to them that verily the guidance from Allah wa ta'ala is the true guidance. And if you follow their whims and desires after the truth has come to you, after knowledge has come to you, after revelation has come to you, then know that you have no one to give you victory and aid you. Allah says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا وَاخْتَلَفُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءُهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Do not be like the disbelievers who disagreed, had discord and differences amongst themselves. Also Allah says, وَمَنْ يُشَاكِقَ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَىٰ وَيَتَّبِعِ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى Finally, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمُهَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ عَمَّا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجًا وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَمَعَكُمْ وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَ وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً وَلَكِنْ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ فِيمَا آتَاكُمْ يعني الله تبارك وتعالى he says محمد ولا تتبع أهواءهم don't follow these people's whims and desires then Allah says, All of you have made you upon a legislation. They were upon a legislation and you are upon a legislation. And this concept, all prophets took it. Nuh he said to his two people, إن كان كبر عليكم مقام وتذكير بآيات الله فعلى الله توكلت فأعلم جميع أمركم فأجمع أمركم وشركاءكم ثم لا يكن أمركم غمة ثم قضوا إلي ولا تنظرون يعني he reminded them of Allah he reminded them of Allah he reminded them of Allah they wouldn't listen and then he said to them إن كان كبر عليكم مقام وتذكير بآيات الله me speaking to you about Allah me reminding you about Allah if that's something you cannot tolerate then he said to them do the following thing my advice to you is uh, he said come together all of you guys plot against me and plan against me do what you guys feel necessary my plan is with Allah I rely on him Ibrahim said to his people mm. I'm free from you and I have nothing to do with you last point inshallah ta'ala which is imitating the non-Muslims and staying away from imitating non-Muslims is a maqsad min maqasid al-shari'ah. It's an objective of our religion. As you can see, the hadith Sahih Muslim in hadith Anas bin Malik, ma yuridu hadha al-rajulu an yad'a min amrina shayin illa khalafana fi. That this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is not a matter in there, uh, out there except that he wants to oppose us in it. You can see that this was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a maqsad min maqasid al-shari'ah. Walidhalik, when the scholars, they talk about maqasid al-shari'ah, they first of all start the introduction by talking about how do you recognize turuqu ma'rifati maqasid al-shari'ah. How do you know this is maqasid al-shari'ah? Then they speak about al-ususu allati taqumu alayha maqasid al-shari'ah. The foundations in which maqasid al-shari'ah stands on. And then after that, they mention four topics, which is part of what maqasid al-shari'ah is. They speak about al-maqsad al-a'zam of the shari'ah, which is tahqiq al lillah. تحقيق عبودية لله establishing عبودية servitude for Allah تبارك وتعالى and then they go to the second type of مقصد which is المقصد الكلي الكبير للشريعة which is بتحصيل المصالح وتكميلها وتعطيل المفاسد وتقليلها that Islam comes to bring about good and increase it or it comes to uh, repel harm or even lessen it if you can't remove it fully it lessens it and then the scholars talk about المقاصد العامة للشريعة which is حياة القلوب وطمئنانها بالإيمان والعمل الصالح and things like that 
And in there, they speak about مخالفت الكفار وعدم التشابه بهم. And that's what Ibn Taymiyyah did in his kitab اختضاء صراط المستقيم. He mentions from the مقاصد العامة للشريعة is مخالفة الكفار وعدم التشابه بهم. Mm. From the مقاصد الخاصة, which is the fourth that the scholars talk about of the شريعة is يعني issues uh, يعني which are specific. And then they mention a khatima, which is a qawaid al-sahiha, to act upon maqasid al-shari'a. Okay. okay. Uh, so I want to summarize just kind of what you said for the people. And please do correct me if I get anything wrong. So you said that uh, imitation can be divided in two types. They can be the permissible imitation and they can be the haram or the impermissible imitation. Mm. And out of that impermissible imitation, you've broken it down into four categories. Mm-hmm. And there's imitating the animals. Yeah. Men imitating women or women imitating men, uh-huh. imitating shaitan. Uh-huh. And then the final one, which is really what we're really going to be discussing in a lot of detail uh, on this podcast, is imitating the non Muslims. And you brought many ayat and ahadith to prove your claims. And the final point you mentioned was that this issue of imitating the non Muslims is such an important issue in our religion that it's actually one of the objectives that the Sharia came to achieve. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to pick up on something you said. You said before you started that. You said, I came up with four. If anybody out there can think of any more, they can add it on. What gives you the right to distinguish this is permissible, this is impermissible, this is allowed, this is not allowed? Is this just from yourself? No. A tashabu which is not allowed is already mentioned and it's stated and it's unanimously agreed upon, which is the tashabu of the non-Muslims that is not allowed is makhtasu bihi, that which they are uniquely known for. Okay. So the Sharia prohibits us to imitate the non-Muslims in that which they are known. Ikhtasu bihi. They are uniquely, it's uniquely theirs. For example, the priest, what he wears, that thing that, he, you know, the clothing he wears. Yeah, but that's clearly an act of worship. Are we just talking about acts of worship? It can even be adat if he wants. It can be norms. If he gets known by a group of people that they wear it, it's not necessarily an act of worship, but they are known to wear it. What's the proof of that? Why, why are you bringing that into it? I understand acts of worship, but I think most Muslims will. But why are you bringing norms, even if they are just unique to them? So, first of all, I need to distinguish one thing, which is the, the, the going against the non-Muslims is in two ways. Okay. And it will all become clear, inshallah. The okay. mukhalaf of the kufar happens in two ways. The first one is fi aslil fi'li. We actually oppose them in the action itself. And we like, for example, celebrating Christmas, for example, or celebrating New Year's. This action in and within itself, we don't act, we don't follow them in this. That's it. We, we don't imitate them. We can't do it because they no, no this is one. And we're going to talk about that later. Inshallah ta'ala. The second time is no. The, we do it, but we dis, we differ with them in the way we do it. Fi wasfihi, in the way that it's being done. So it's mukhalifat fi asli fi'li. Or fi wasfi, as Ibn Taymiyyah mm-hmm. stated. An example of the wasf is, for example, fasting in general. As you know, fasting in general is something legislated for us and it's also legislated for them. Mm-hmm. Allah mentions the Quran, Ya yuladina amanu kutib ali, ya yuladina ya yuladina amanu kutib ali kumus siyamu, kama kutib ali yuladina min kablikum, la ala kum tatakun. And we, f- we see the Jews today fasting. They fast. They actually do fast. So, how do we go against them and how do we distinguish us from, us, from ourselves? What we do is we do something. That makes us different from them. The Prophet told us, he said, Faslu ma baynana. I'm a Faslu ma bayna siyamina wa siyami halil kitabi akla tu sahri. And Imam Muslim narrated this. The way to distinguish our fasting from their fasting is the way we do it. We do what's known as suhoor. They don't have that. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, that's what he would do alayhi salatu wa sallam. As you know, Ashura, we fast on that day. The mm-hmm. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, let's do it on the ninth. Because they do it the tenth, let's add the ninth on it. So this is mukhalafatu. في وصفه يعني we we go against them in the in the in the description and the form in which it's done. Okay. لكن not في أصل الفعل not the أصل الفعل the فعل is legislated in our religion. Now Sheikh Al Islam Taymi mentioned something very powerful. He said أن المشاركة في الهدي الظاهر imitating the non-Muslims from the outer appearance تورث تناسبا وتشاكنا بين المتشابهين. What it does is that it makes these two people become one. يقود إلى الموافقة في الأخلاق والأعمال وهذا أمر محسوس. If someone starts to copy someone in the way that they look and everything, you start acting like that person. And he said this is something that's known out of reality. For example, he gave Ibn Taymiyyah gave an example that everyone can relate to. He said فإن اللابس لثياب أهل العلم. If someone wears the clothing of the people of knowledge, يجد من نفسه نوع من نوع انضمام إليه. He feels that he's part of a group. He's 
part of the, the scholarly circle. That's what he starts to think. وَلَّابِسُ لِثِيَابِ الْجَنْدِ الْجُنْدِ, sorry. The one who's wearing the clothing of the jundi, an army man. الْمُقَاتِلَةِ مَثَلًا يَجِدُ فِي نَفْسِهِ نَوْعَ تَخَلُّقِ بِأَخْلَاقِهِمْ The person starts to see that he has the character of a soldier and he acts in that way. And that's the reality. Little kids today, when you put a abaya on a young girl, mm. what, she, what does she start to do? She looks for the sajada. She goes, Allahu mm-hmm. Akbar, and she starts praying. So mm-hmm. don't you ever think to yourself, there's no talazum between the zahir and the That there's no relationship between the outer and the inner. Oh, there is. Mm. Oh, there is. So our religion, this is what it doesn't want. And it's fighting against, which is that this imitating of the non-Muslims, what would it do? It would lead us to, um, it will lead us to loving them. Mualat. And this is something the Sharia, as you know, the ayahs have come regarding it. And the Prophet Sallallahu he would make sure he teaches his, he taught his companions the outer appearance has a very powerful effect. The Prophet Sallallahu said to his companions, لا يغلبنكم العراب على اس, على اسم صلاتكم العشاء فإن في كتاب الله العشاء فإن تعتم بحلا, بحلاب الإبلي. The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu he said, don't let the, the Bedouin people overcome you by changing the name of your prayer. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and he don't imitate them. So what I'm trying to say to you is that we have to understand that the tashabbuh al-mubah, the tashabbuh which is allowed, is number one. Allah yakun hadha al-amru min taqalidihim. This is not from their adat and their symbols that they are distinct and unique, number one. Not not religious symbols. You're just talking about their customs and their Even culture. the customs and their taqalid okay. and their customs. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about their customs. Number two is Allah yakun dhalika al-amru min sharahim. It also can't be a matter of their legislation, okay. which has been mentioned that it's from their shara. And it's stated, you have evidence to prove that this is from their legislation. Yeah, and a reliable source you have it from. Either Allah mentions it, or the Prophet ﷺ mentions it, or there is a, يعني متواتر, that this is their legislation. Like, like for example, the prostration of uh, greeting. It's called sajjatul tahiyya. Previous nations, as you can see from the Quran, فَخَرُّوا لَهُ سُجَّدًا نَبِي اللَّهِ يُوسُفَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ they all fell into prostration for him. Hmm. This sajda to tahiyya, which is jaiz fil umam is the early nations, you find that it's permissible. Adam alayhi salam, prostration was done for him. They were prostrated for him. This is something that is in their legislation allowed. But in our legislations, la. The Prophet said, لو كنت, أحد, لو كنت آمرا أحدا أن يسجد لأحد if I was to command someone to prostrate for someone, la amartu al marat and tasjud li zawriya li adam al haqqa alayha. Oh, kama kala alayhi salam. I would have commanded the woman to prostrate for her husband because of the rights that he has on upon her. But no one's allowed to prostrate for anybody. Okay. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Also, the third one is, Allah yakuna fi shar'ina bayanun khasu li dhalik. If we have a specific ruling in this matter, then we don't definitely go to them. We definitely don't take anything yeah, from them. Makes sense. Okay. Number four, the fourth point is, Allah tu addi hadhi al-muwafaqat ila muqalafat amri min umri shari'a. The following of them should not lead any harm or any problem to a legislation within our religion. Number five is, Allah takun al-muwafaqat fi ayadim. We can't, we can't, Follow them in their celebrations because of the statement of the Prophet ﷺ when he came to the city of Medina and they told him about their celebrations. And then he said to them, Allah has exchanged for you all of the celebrations into these two. The Prophet said that. I want to go into that. We'll no problem. And the sixth one is, also, if there has to be followed in, then it has to be, as we're going to mention later, inshallah ta'ala, it has to be in issues which there is a need for us to follow in it, and we should also increase in that. Okay. I'm not going to deny here, and I'm not going to sit here and say, you know what, the Prophet ﷺ didn't follow in the non-Muslims in anything. Mm. We find that he followed them in matters of the world, Correct. worldly issues. For example, issues of battles. Do you know the term al-khandaq? Mm. It's actually not an Arab word, word. it's actually a Persian word. It comes okay. from the word kandah. Kandakaf nun dal ha. It's actually not a, and it came from Salman al Farisi in the battle of the battle of Khandaq, am Ghazwat al Hazab, that Salman al Farisi radiyallahu taala anhu, ahlu Sir mentioned it, the people of Sirah, they mentioned that Salman al Farisi ya Rasulullah inna kunna bi Faris, when we were in Persia, Faris, ida husirna if we were sieged, Khandaqna, we placed a, yani a trench, alayna around ourselves. This was not known by the Arabs. Arabs did not know it. Mm. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, okay, that's good. Let's take that on. 
Mm. Not only that, they took the term as well. So the term is also not Arabic. And also this concept was also not Arabic. Also the concept of using nash above the janaz of the woman, for example, placing the not grabbing the woman when they when they when they are carrying her body mm. and placing her in a nash. And Imam al Tabarani mentions in his author, Min Tariq Khalid ibn Rashidin, Abu Uthman, he said a narrated from Dawood ibn Abi Hindin, who narrated from Shabi, that Asma bint Umaysin, she said, and Nabnatan li Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is Ruqayya, Tufiya she died, wa kan yahmiluna al rijal wa nisa ala al asarati sawa'a, the men and women were carrying her. فقلت يا رسول الله أو مسجد الله إني كنت بأرض الحبشة so she said يا رسول الله I was in the land of the Abyssinians يعني I was in أرض الحبشة وهم نصارى أهل كتاب they are Christians people of the scripture هم يجعلون للمرأة نعشا and they place a nash for the woman a coffin فوق الضلاع above her الضلاع her bones يكرهون أن يوصف شيء من من خلقها they they scared that the woman's physique and her body might show Shall I not make it Can I not make a na'ash for your daughter like that? The Prophet then said Ij'alihi, make it فَهِيَ أَوَّلُ مَنْ جَعَلَ نَعْشًا فِي الْإِسْلَامِ She was the first person to make it in Islam لِرُقَيَّةِ بِنَةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ So yes, I'm not going to sit here and say We have, for example, the concept of تَارِيخُ التَّدْوِينَ تَدْوِينُ الدَّوَوِينَ Which today is like the government's electronic Directory service, for example, where all the people in that country's data is collected in there. Ibn Sa'adin mentions in his tabaqat that Umar radiallahu anhu istashara al-Muslimina fi tadween al-diwan. As you know, Muslims were spreading the world, were conquering one land after another. So Umar radiallahu anhu sat with them and he asked them, what do, we, what do we do with this directory service? The government needs to have a directory service where we collect all data of, of the people. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, تَقْسِمُ كُلَّ سَنَةٍ مَجْتَمْعَ إِلَيْكَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ مَالٍ I have an idea, Ali said. Ali said, my idea is all of the wealth that you have, disperse it, give it all out. وَلَا تُمْسِكْ مِنْهُ شَيْءٍ Don't hold on to anything. Don't let anything stay in the Baytul Mal Muslimin. Everything spread it out. Uthman رضي الله عنه, he said, أَرَى مَالًا كَثِيرًا I see that wealth is too much. يَسَعُ النَّاسِ It's enough for the people. وَإِن لَمْ يُحْصَوْ حَتَّى تَعْرِفَ مَنْ أَخَذَ مِمَّا لَمْ يَأْخُذ Uthman رضي الله عنه said, I see that this wealth is too much. It won't be, يعني, وَإِن لَمْ يُحْصَوْ Even if it's not restricted. We need to know who took it and who didn't take it. We, there has to be. خَشِيتُ أَنْ يَنْتَشِرَ الْأَمْرُ الوليد بن هشام بن المغيرة He said, يَا أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ قَدْ جِئْتُ الشَّامَ I came from Sham. فَرَأَيْتُ مُلُوكَهَا I saw its kings. قَدْ دَوَّنُوا دِيوَانًا وَجَنَّدُوا جُنُودًا I've seen that the Sham's leaders and its kings they have the government's directory service. And they, their polices are registered, their people are registered, everything. Umar then said, فَأَخَذَ He said, good. Even history, do you know that, right? Tariq in Islam. And mm-hmm. Hafiz al-Hadr mentions in Fathul Bari that history, Tariq of Islam, we didn't have a time, how we have his, you have Hijriya right now, right? Mm-hmm. Hijriya is what? It's after the Prophet migrated to Medina. Mm-hmm. Why is it starting from there, not from Mecca time? Mm. Why is it not starting from the Prophet's birth, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yeah, and even where did this even come from? The issue of you know, tarikh. Ibn Sirin mentions. He said, "Qadim a rajul min al Yemen. A man came from Yemen. فقال he said, 'رأيت باليمن شيئا يسمونه تاريخ. I went to Yemen and I've seen them do something known as tarikh. يكتبونه من عام كذا أو شهر كذا. They they have a yeah, يعني, a diary where they write inside there. This year this thing happened. This month this happened." And he is called history, he said. فَقَالَ عُمَرُ هَذَا حَسَنٌ فَأَرِخُ This is good. Right. Then write the history. Okay. So these are non-Muslims okay. that are being, it's being taken from. One last final point I want to add on to prove that the Prophet ﷺ followed the Ahlul Jahiliyyah uh, in some issues, which he affirms Wasallam. From those things is a mas'ala that the Usuliyin and the Fuqaha, especially the Fuqaha, speak about, known as al qasama And al qasama is a person has been killed a person is being murdered and uh, there's no conclusive evidence to point towards who the uh, perpetrator of this crime is. Mm. They don't have enough evidence. For example, little kids are saying, we saw him doing it. But mm. in Islamic court, little kids are not you know, a testimony. Or the blood of the, the, uh, the, 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 the person is on this accused. 
it, it, there's some stains of blood on him. That's also not conclusive evidence in Islam. All of these are not conclusive evidence. Conclu there's no shuhada, there's no test, there's no witnesses. So the family who lost their loved one, they have a high speculation that this particular person did it to them. So there's this concept al-qasama that existed qabla al-Islam. And Imam Muslim narrated in his sahih and also Nasa'i narrated it. All of them narrated it min tariqi ibn Wahbin. He said, akhbarana yurusun an ibn shihab al-Zuhri. He said, akhbarani Abu Salamat ibn Abdul Rahman wa Sunayman ibn Yasarin, mawla maymuna tazawji. Uh, النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن رجل من أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and the ambiguity of this companion لا يضر إبهام الصحابي لا يضر a man from the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was from Ansar he mentions and he says أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أقر القسامة على ما كانت عليه في الجاهلية the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he affirmed القسامة as it was before جاهلية and القسامة as I mentioned is that the family have to swear by Allah they have to swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a dispute amongst the ulama. What does al-Qasama mean? For example, uh, Ibn Faris and al-Jawhari, they believe al-Qasama actually means the yameen, the oath itself. Whereas al-Azhari and a group who follow him, they believe it's a ismu lil awliya'i alladhina yahrifuna ala istihqaqi dami al-maqtool. It's actually the family who are going to swear uh, for the lost one. They're going to swear that this person is the one who committed mm. it. Now this concept of al-Qasama, of course in Islam, the concept's there, but it's not the same as Qabla al-Islam. There are some things Islam changed. For example, there are conditions Islam stipulated for it. That the person has to, the qasama only comes about if it is ala qatli yujibul qisas. A person is being killed. It can't be on other, uh, other matters. Ibn Qudama, Muwafaquddin Ibn Qudama brings an ijma' and he says, لا أعلم بين أهل العلم في هذا اختلاف. I don't know any distinguished disagreement in this matter that the qasama is only made for the blood money. Also, it has to be ala shakhsin muayyan. It has to be a specific person because of the hadith that Imam Muslim narrated in his sahih uh, where he said, يقسم خمسين منكم على رجل منهم فيدفعوا برمته. So the 50 people from this side have to swear upon a particular person. It can be even a particular group of people, but they have to name the people that they believe committed the crime. Also, the awliya uh, have to all agree. The awliya fi fi da'wa, those fi da'wa, they all have to agree on this issue. And last but not least, there has to be wujudul loath. And the issue of loath means, there's a dispute, there's two qawls, what loath means. Some of the ulama, they say the loath means al-adawat wal al-zahira. There has to be uh, animosity between the killed one and the one that they are accusing of killing. But the strongest opinion is that the loath means ma rajjaha janiban mudda'i fi da'wahu. And that's the qawl al-riwaya al Imam Ahmed and also Ibn Taymiyyah chose. Which is that there are signs that actually point out that this person is the one who committed it. So it's not just mere claim. But okay. Ibn Hajar and he brought ijma'a. In this matter, he said, اتفق كلهم على أنها لا تجب القسامة لمجرد دعوة الأولياء حتى يقترن بها شبهة يغلب الظن الحكم بها. So this concept of القسامة is one of those things the Prophet affirmed. أقر القسامة على ما كانت في الجاهلية على ما كانت عليه في الجاهلية. It's something that the Prophet took from the pre-Islamic يعني جاهلية and he affirmed it عليه الصلاة والسلام. So I'm not denying there are things within our religion that mm -hmm. were taken from the pre-Islamic jahiliya. They were taken from them, and but they were modified, they were corrected. Okay. But not everything was taken from Fine. them. Okay, so I'm going to go into celebrations and uh, clothing in a lot more detail later on in the podcast, um, like you mentioned before. But I just want to understand something here because I'm struggling to, to get my head around this. You, I think everyone from the Muslims would agree that we can't follow the non-Muslims in their religious things, whether that be their celebrations, whether that be their clothing, specific to their religion, like the priest collar like we discussed Amen. earlier. But you also said that we can't follow them in other things that are non-religious matters, Amen. right? And then you came, came up with lots and lots and lots of examples of the Prophet wasallam and his companions following the non-Muslims in other things other than their religious matters. So give me something tangible, give me a principle. How do you distinguish? How can someone at home distinguish? I can follow them in this, but I can't follow in that. And I'm talking about customs, not talking about acts of worship, but I can follow them in this and I can't follow in that. Give me a principle, how can someone decide? Okay, when it comes to the previous nations, the pre previous nations, there are things that are legislated in their religion and it's also sometimes legislated in our religion. 
So they've been given a command in this issue, and so have we. Okay. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. All those of you who believe, fasting has been prescribed unto you as it has been prescribed on those who came before you. So now we're going to do this. That makes sense, yeah. The ulama unanimously agree upon that. We're doing it mainly because it's mentioned in our religion. But we also clearly know that they did it as well. Okay. The second one is, um, there isn't a sahih evidence to point out that they you, they did it. We don't have it from the Prophet clearly and categorically. We also don't have it they from... Don't, they didn't do what, sorry? That this action is something that is part of their religion. Okay, you've moved on from fasting. You're talking about general principles. Yeah, now I'm... I'm yeah. Okay, okay. So our first point was something that is clearly and categorically mentioned in their religion and it's also mentioned in our religion we to affirm do. it. We'll do that one. That's that makes sense. That there's makes no sense. dispute on okay. that. But the second one is it's not authentically transmitted from their religion that they did it. It's Israeliyat. It's transmitted here or there. Or, um, or even say there is an authentic evidence to prove that it's a legislation for them. But there is also a clear-cut evidence in our religion that abrogates it. Mm. And it is our religion is saying it. This one, la اعتبار له, whether, whether of those two situations it is. We don't give it any consideration because Allah wa ta'ala, He told us that وَيَضَعُ عَنْهُمْ إِسْرَهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلِهِمْ The, is, the Isra, the إغلال, إغلال, إغلال was removed from us. Mm. In other words, our religion, Aslan, is to abrogate all of those. And it's abrogated. It. خلاص, it's mm. sorted now. The third thing is, which is a محل النزاع. There's a dispute amongst the ulama in this whole issue, which is something is authentically mentioned in the Quran and it's also mentioned in the Sunnah that it's something they practice. Mm. Okay? Even if it has been transmitted to us through a khabar I had, for example, it doesn't matter. Lakin, we don't have fi shara'ina ma yu'ayyidu wa yuqarriru. Something in our religion that affirms it or proves it. We don't have it. Also, we don't have ma yubatiluhu wa yansakhu. We don't have something that's nullifying it or abrogating it. We don't have. Majority of the scholars are of the opinion that this type uh it's a hujja. There's a large amount of scholars. Akhtaru al-ulama. And shara'a man qablana, they say the legislation that came before us uh, in this is hujja yaqtadi al bihi. We can act upon it. Um, that's a lot of scholars. Or the majority, I could say. Ibn Taymiyyah mentions it. Al-Futuhi mentions it in his Kawkab al-Munir. Amin al also mentions it in his Mudhakira. Lakin, when we look at the Quran and the Sunnah from my humble research, mm. the zahir al-mutakarrira the zahi that is apparent is that the Quran says no. In this one, that's Bukhalaf. This is Madhab al-Imam al-Shafi'i and also the call of Ibn Hazmin. Which is Allah says in the ayah, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْ هَاجَ We've all made you upon a legislation. Mm. Also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? أُعْطِيتُ خَمْسًا I was given five. لَمْ يُعْطَهُنَّ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ قَبْلِ I've been given five. No prophet before me was given. And from, the, from those was that the Prophet said, وَكَانَ النَّبِيُّ يُبْعَثُ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِ خَاصَةً A Prophet was sent to his people specifically. وَبُعِثْتُ إِلَىٰ النَّاسِ كَافَةً And I was sent to all people. Even that Prophet's legislation is restricted to his people, not to us. Even these, these are things that are not necessarily clearly ordered. Are you talking about things that are not necessarily clearly ordered in the Qur'an and the Sunnah? I'm talking about matters of legislation in the religion, Sharia, matters okay. of Sharia. Five things the Prophet said is being given to me and it hasn't been given to them. And from those things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned, which is the last one, he said, وَكَانَ النَّبِي يُبْعَثُ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ خَاصَةً A Prophet will be sent to his people specifically. Mm. وَبْعُثُ إِلَىٰ النَّاسِ كَافَةً And I was sent to all mankind. Bukhari and Muslim both narrated that in Hadith Jabir ibn Abdullah رضي الله تعالى عنهما. So this shows that our Sharia, Sharia to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's not upon us to have to follow يعني, their legislation. Ibn Hazmin really يعني, argued strongly on this issue in his kitab. Al-Ihkam, the second volume, and also in his Nubad, page 91. I've got a hadith that might say something different. Okay. This hadith is found in Sahih al-Bukhari. كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يحب موافقة أهل الكتاب فيما لم يؤمر فيه. So this hadith is saying that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to love, he used to love agreeing with the people of the book in matters where there is not a clear command. For example, Allah is not clearly commanding us to be different from them. He used to, he used, actually used to follow the legislation. That goes exactly against what you're saying right now. This hadith Ibn Abbas narrated in Sahih, Sahih Muslim. 
that the Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can yuhib muwafaqat ahli al-kitab that the Prophet used to love alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to agree with the people of the scripture fi ma lam yu'mar fihi bi shay'in in a matter which he wasn't commanded to do something um, for example istiqbal bayt al-maqdis for example some scholars mentioned that and also agreeing um, with the Yahud fi sawm yawm al-ashura Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah responded to this in three ways the first one is uh, the matters which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agreed with them was at the beginning. That was the early stages of Islam. Mm. Then he got abrogated. Okay? And it was then legislated for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he was rather commanded to not follow them, alayhi salatu uh, Because if you look at the same hadith itself that you mentioned, mm-hmm. لم يؤمر فيه بشيء, in it is, أنه سدل شعره موافقة لهم. That the Prophet sallallahu let his hair down yeah. Yeah. in agreement to them. ثم فرق شعره بعده. But then so after that, what did he do? He then divided himself. Imam Muslim narrated that in Sahih. And the Prophet changed the following of them at the beginning of Islam. So that's an issue that I want you to understand. It's, okay. it's, no, it's not always the case. As for the Prophet وسلم, agreeing with the Yahud of the day of Ashura, no, the Prophet وسلم, actually used to fast before he migrated to Medina. On that, on that specific day? Yeah, he used to fast Alayhi wa sallam Aisha radiallahu anha She mentioned كان ي... كان يوم عاشوراء, The day of Ashura تصومه قريش في الجاهلية Quraysh used to fast Before Islam وكان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يصومه في الجاهلية And the Prophet used to fast uh, It in جاهلية فلما قدم المدينة When he came to Medina صامه he fasted it وأمر بالصيامه And he commanded the people to psalm Fasted فلما فرض رمضان When Ramadan was يعني ordered or commanded Taraka yawmu Ashura The Prophet left Ashura Then فَمَنْ شَاءَ أَصَامَهُ وَمَنْ شَاءَ تَرَكَهُ And Imam al-Bukhari narrated it Ibn Abi Shayba narrated it من سند, بسنده, Which is authentic عن أبي هريرة مرفوعا He said صُومُ يَوْمُ Ashura Which explains my point very much The Prophet said Fast the day of Ashura يَوْمَ كَانَتِ الْأَنْبِيَاءُ عَلَيْهِمُ الصَّلَاةُ وَسَلَامُ تَصُومُهُ فَصُومُهُ The Prophet said Fast the day of Ashura For verily it was a day that the Prophets عَلَيْهِ مُصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامِ used to fast تَصُومُهُ فَصُومُهُ So Ashura, the Prophet fasted it not لِمُوَافَقَةِ الْيَهُودِ in agreements to the Jews but rather when he did it did hit, he did it was لِمُوَافَقَةِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ عَلَيْهِ okay. مُصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامِ okay. okay And that's at the ending of the hadith the Prophet mentioned it. he said نَحْنُ أَحَقُّ وَأَوْلَى بِمُوسَى مِنْكُمْ that we yeah. are hadith ibn Abbas we are more Rightful, and we are we are more closer to Musa than you guys. Okay, okay. Look, I I want to rephrase the question I asked because I'm not talking about religious things. I'm not talking about things in the Deen of Islam. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about fasting, for example. I'm talking about things from the dunya, which we know that the asal is that they're permissible, right? Yeah, yes, that's, that's asal. Yeah, that's asal, that's asal. Okay, things that are from the dunya. Now, you you said that we can't copy the. And let's not just say Jews and Christians, let's bring it to the modern day context. Yeah. We can't copy the non-Muslims in things that are from the dunya, you said. And then you went on to bring loads of hadith and, and narrations like, for example, Amr ibn al-Khattab actually bringing governmental systems that he saw from the, the non-Muslims at that time. So get, uh, help me, help someone at home understand. They've seized practices from the non-Muslims. Are they allowed to copy them? Are they, how can they determine what they can copy them in and what they can't? I mentioned it to you. If this issue has become something they're known for it, it became a sha'ira min sha'airihim. It became a norms, a symbol they're known for. Yatamayyazuna biha. That they become distinct okay, for. But what do you mean by that? Something that then only they're doing it. When you see that, you're going to be like, if I wore, for example. But that's religious. No, it's not. Color. The priest doesn't wear it because of religious reasons. That's part of their religion to wear that, no? Uh, I mean, that's why we say the priest wears it. We're not saying yeah, all the, the priest, Christians, the, the laymen yeah, wear but the, it. The, the, Okay, I'll give you an example. Go on. When I wear the imama today, yeah. and I wear the bisht on top of it, yeah. the big Saudi bisht, what do you think of me straight away? Like a, like a scholar. For a example. scholar. So it, it, this matter is not halal or haram. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about it's uniquely known for the ulama to wear yeah. it. That, that's my point. It's wherever, I might not be good with examples because, by the way, it's an important point and as a, I think it's a fact that I think inshallah ta'ala many of us have to know is that examples sometimes people use it to repel a principle what do you mean? for example a principle has been mentioned uh, it's been elaborated on evidences have been brought for it and then someone comes and tries to push that principle based on an example here or there 
ذا آه. بويت صاحب المراقي سير والشأن لا يعترض المثال اذ كف اذ قد كفى الفرض والاحتمال يو كانت ريبيل ا برنسيبل جست بيكوز اوف ان اكزامبل بيكوز ام جست جيفينغ يو ذا اكزامبل جست سو يو انديرستاند ذا برنسيبل ماي اكزامبل ماي نوت ايفن بي ذا موست اكوريت وان ذا ايديا جست للتقريب اتس جست تو جيت انديرستاندينغ كلوز تو يو Okay, then people reject the example because it doesn't quite fit, and yeah, as a result, we, they go on to reject the yeah, principle. principle. So let's let's just talk about the principle then. How what principle is it? You just said your principle is things that are uniquely to them. What does that mean exactly? Does that mean only they're doing it? For example. Yeah, Or yeah. For example, you, you, when you look at trousers, do you think that's uniquely for the non-Muslims? No, I think Muslims uh, are doing uh, it as well. It's, it's not just Muslims are doing it. It's not known for anybody. Trousers is about it's a, it's a it's something fine. Like I don't. I want to look at somebody's wearing trousers, and you wouldn't look at someone wearing trousers. Uh, yeah, but that's only become like that. Like for example, and that's only become like that because the Muslims took it on. So l- l- let me break down the issue of trousers, for example. To say, let's just say, and I don't really know the full history behind trousers, but let's say, for example, the non-Muslims invented trousers, right? Ooh, the non-Muslims. The non-Muslims invented trousers just for the. It's I'd, not the fact that they invented it. By the way, it's that's not the, fine. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But so far, we're allowed to follow them, right? You're saying mm-hmm. listen, the fact that they invented it is not an issue. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they've invented trousers. But my point is now that the people who are wearing trousers at that time, John, Matthew, Luke, whatever, you know, Brian, these are all non-Muslims. Mm-hmm. Abdullah comes along now. Mm-hmm. And at that point, moment in time, only the non-Muslims are wearing trousers. Okay. It's only now because Muslims took it on that we say trousers are not known for a particular kind of people. Everybody wears trousers. But Muslims took it on when it was actually only for the non-Muslims. It's only known at that time. No, 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 no. No, you would have to prove that. Wow. Well, if we say anything that the non-Muslims invented, whether it be trousers, whether it be the internet, they whether have, it be technology, they... anything, at one moment in time, no Muslim had it. How? Until How do you the know? Fir- well, because they invented it, so they're non-Muslim. You have and to the prove first... that they invented it. Trousers. Okay, let's just say internet. Let's just say something. We agree that cars. Do we agree that non-Muslims invented cars or the internet or anything like that? There is something in the dunya that only the non-Muslims invented. Let's just say cars, for example. At that time, no. You're mixing had two it. things, Shahid. The concept of inventing and the concept of them being known for it is two different things. Okay, so define what is known being known. As a قاعدة العلماء منشوا العرف معمول به إذا ورد حكم من الشري حكم من الشرع الشريف لم يحد. We have to act upon the urf. The urf is the custom and the norms of the people. Mm. These are some issues we have to look at the urf, the custom and the norms of those pe- the people. For example, for example. Mm. The uh, shvaka miss you guys wear right? Yeah. Did I pronounce it correctly? I think so. <laughs> yeah, okay. I hope so. Men and women both wear it, right? Okay. Yeah. Is it something known for the men, and not for the women, or is it known for the women and the men? No, they both wear it. Exactly. So now nobody can come and bring the hadiths of men imitating women. But was there a point where it was just known for men? They could have been right. Even the if, men it, might... even if it, it could change over time, no problem. Yeah. Okay, but at that point. When men wore it and it was just the men, and then the women started wearing, it, they did something wrong, right? And now all the women who wear it, they're following a sunnah that was wrong in the first place. Do you see my point? No, I mean oh, the people did are going to be sinners, no doubt. But those who come hundred years later, oh, I see. Okay, they're, they're not going to. Be... We judge things based on how they are, regardless of what happened. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Fine. Okay. Anything that is yani yatamayyazuna biha. By the way, we're talking about umur dunyawi. We're not talking about deen. No, definitely not. Of course, we're talking about the dunya. Yeah. We're talking about these are shuroot fil umur dunyawi matters of the dunya. Allah yakun hada al amr min taqalidhim wa shi'arihim alati yatamayyazun biha. This cannot be things, customs, and symbols that they are distinct and unique. It can't be. The second condition I mentioned is that Allah yakun dalik al amr min shara'ihim. It can't be from their religion. Yeah. Okay. This can't be. A matter of their which religion. we agree, which we agree. Like for example, I gave such a tahiyya. The third one is, "Alla yakuna fi shara'ina bayanun khasu li dalik." There can't be a specific ruling for us in this issue that kind of repels what they are upon. That makes sense. That makes sense. Number four is, "Alla tu adi hadi muafakatu ila muqalafati amri min umuri sharia." For example, us following them in this issue cannot lead to, cannot lead to, um. Abandoning a rule from the Sharia. Exactly. Example. Yeah. And last, uh, fifth one. Sorry, not the last one. Is Allah taqul muafakat fi ayadi? We cannot agree with them in their celebrations. Which okay. Inshallah, we're going to speak about. To and the sixth and final point, eight point is Allah taqul muafakat bi hasab an taqul muafakat bi hasab al hajat al matlubat wa la tazid wa ala. It has to all be in line with the needs. Okay. So even then, when it comes to worldly issues, we shouldn't try to overly do it if there's no need for it, because we. Even then, we still want to have our unique things. 
even though it's something mubah, no problem, but we also still want to establish our independency as Muslims and our unique existence and that we're not like them. So even that though, trousers and jeans and all of this is fine. It's not haram. Mm. No one can make it haram. But it's good to avoid it. Don't overly do it. Okay. Okay. So I think most of the people watching will probably agree with many of the conditions that you stated. For example, we can't follow them in matters of their religion. Makes sense. We can't follow them if it goes against our religion. Again, makes sense. But I really want to pinpoint on this thing about matters related to the dunya. And I know at the end you said, even then it's better to avoid, but you did say it's mubah. We can't make it haram. If that's the case, then what's the point of even discussing this? Isn't this fall under the principle la in kalafi masal al-ijtihad? Someone might look at something and say, I believe that's uniquely for the non-Muslims. Another person might look at the same thing and be like, nah, I don't really think it is. And therefore, this is just an ijtihadi issue. Why are we even talking about it? Why just folk, this, Why not focus on just the religious bits and let the dunya just do what you want? This goes back to an issue that I mentioned before, which is, it goes back to the custom and the urf. And the urf is not determined by one person's feeling. Custom is determined by what the community sees. If I walked in today, if a non-Muslim came walking to you right now with a bisht and a igal and, uh, you know, all of that, what would you say to him? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> he never said anything to you. He never spoke to you. Just by seeing him. Are you there? Mm. I remember one time, subhanAllah, it was Halloween. They knocked on my door and they, one of them were wearing that. As a costume. As a costume. And I said, Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> think he's a Muslim. And they said, oh, I'm not a Muslim. Chick or treat. Mm. And just close the door. The point I'm trying to come to is that clothing... Yani, that's unique for a people Makes you th be People start believe You're part of those people You're, you're one of them if I, if I was marrying Soldiers clothes You think I'm a, yeah, true. a soldier yeah, okay. If I was If I was wearing Police officer clothes yani, It's illegal to wear Police officer's clothes You're not allowed to Why? Why are you not allowed to If you're not a police officer Someone's going to think You're a police officer Exactly And it's illegal You could be arrested for it yeah. um, So mm. yani, The concept of Your outer appearance and the way that you dress, if it's in line with the non-Muslims, but there is no tamayus, they're not uniquely known for the non-Muslims, okay. then inshallah ta'ala is fine. If it's something everybody wears, you, Muslims can wear that, non-Muslims. And, uh, and this can change from time and place? It can change, yes, it can change of course. From time and place. Okay, fine. Let's go on to, in fact, we've already discussed clothing quite a bit. So let's go on to it. Um, I've got some very specific questions because a lot of common questions that come up uh, and I know these are examples so it might be uh, you know feel free to, to say what you want about that but is there anything wrong with wearing a suit for example I don't believe it's specific to the non-Muslims I think Muslims wear it when they go to work yeah I mean again I, I, my humble research I don't see how that's unique for the non-Muslims Muslims can wear it but again again I'm not saying it's haram you can wear suits I call it monkey suits you can wear it if you want to. Mm. You can dress yourself in that way. Uh, there's nothing haram about it. Mm. As long as, of course, your aura is not showing and, of course, it's not your physique and everything is not appearing, then okay. no, no problem. It's fine. Okay. You said men aren't allowed to wear clothing that re imitates women. Yeah. Women are known to wear dresses. Oh. You're wearing a dress. That's not known. See, it's like saying there's a type of, for example, uh, clothing. It's a common to clothe. A type of it is known for women and the other type is not known for women. Does that make sense? Explain it a bit more. So the clothing that's known by, yeah, I mean, uh, clothing that's known, for example, when you see a miniskirt, you know that's that's what women wear. Correct, yeah. But then you see a Scottish man. It's ah, a cultural okay, kilt, thing for, yeah, uh, that, yeah the kilts they, they wear. You wouldn't think this is a female. This is what they wear. But عادةً, if they go outside their land, this is considered to be what? Mm -hmm. It's considered to be a women's clothing. So if you saw a brother walking right now in front of you and he was wearing a thobe, would you think he's imitating women? No. You wouldn't. Um, but if he goes out of his land and he goes to the UK, for example, are you saying he shouldn't wear a thobe based on your example? Not in the, no, it's not because it's something the Prophet wore, so he has a and it's sanctioned, the permissibility is sanctioned by the Prophet. This concept of can you or can't you is generally used for something that the Prophet never wore, like jeans or things like that. Can you, can't you? And if, for example, if you wore jeans in one particular land, it's not haram again, but it's. Is it sanctioned or is it or is it just the culture? For example, did the Prophet wear anything different to Abu Jahl or Abu Lahab? 
Of course not. They're just wearing the same clothes. It's not sanctioned as part of our religion. It was their culture. Mm. But in the UK, it's very much known for women. So there's not, that's why when you go to a land and their clothing is not wrong, it's fine to wear their clothings. As long as you cover the aura and the blue ah, clothing, like the principles. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. If I go to Indonesia, I wear their clothes. If I go to India, for example, I wear the Indian clothes. Mm -hmm. If I go to Africa, I dress the way the Africans dress. That's fine. There's nothing yani, wrong with that per se. For example, when I went to India, I wore the Indian clothes. Mm. If I go to somewhere in West Africa, I would, uh, one of the first things I would ask is like, can you guys give me your clothing? So I, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, fine. it's actually nice that you, you integrate with the society. You look like them. It's fine. As long as their clothing is not haram. Mm -hmm. What I mean is that is it are they known for this clothes is a different story, discussion. Yeah, I understand. I understand. If it's something yatamayazuna biha, it's a problem. What well, what if someone sees something that the non Muslims are known for and he finds it very beautiful, for example, and he tries to bring in the hadith, Inna Allaha Jamilun wa yuhibbul Jamal. And Inna he says, For this reason, for example, I want to wear the clothes of the non-Muslims. Wallahi, the, you, that's what the hadith is in the It's placed in the hadith in, in, a, in a wrong place. In Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful and he loves his beauty. In Allah tayyibun la yakbalu illa tayyiban. The hadith like that. Those are umumat. They are general evidences. And in Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Someone could say, okay, Allah is beautiful. He loves beauty. And a sister says, I'm going to wear miniskirt. It's beautiful. People like it when I show my legs. Mm -hmm. And she can use that hadith in the right. wrong place. No, we have to understand the hadith in its context. It shouldn't take it out of its context. Yeah, I mean, the Sharia is there to, to allow us, or the Sharia is, or the Quran and the Sunnah are there to govern us, to control us, to tell us what and where we can do things. So take all the evidences together, basically. I want to take one random hadith out of out of. Okay, last question on clothing. Um, wearing things like football kits, for example, you see Muslim children wearing it, you see non-Muslim children wearing it. It's just become like kind of a culture. Anything wrong with that? The concept of football, football is a discussion and it requires a, itself a discussion about the reality of football. So I think let's suspend that, maybe okay. another podcast on the concept of supporting a team, you know, because it's not just wearing clothes. Al -wala, al -bara, and There's a concept like of allegiance here. Mm. There's a concept of love and hate. Like, for example, if you wear that T-shirt, but you go on the wrong side of the bench, you're wearing a Chelsea T-shirt, for example, and Chelsea and Manchester, you know, it's a game. And you accidentally sleep, sit, sit down with the, the you know, the wrong Manchester, crowd, yeah. Manchester crowd. You're in trouble. You're in big trouble. They'll beat you up. And fights happen because... Of, the point is that the clothing of football is another discussion, I think, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, uh... A follow-up question on, on on football, but it might be easier to answer um, because it doesn't require a big discussion potentially, is what about people, and we said that we can't wear things that are specific to religious, like they have symbols, like the cross, for example. Yeah. Uh, what if someone's wearing a football kit but has a cross on the badge, for example? That's even worse than mm. just wearing the clothing. See, it's levels. You see, I told you before, something is, they're not, the non-Muslims are known to do it. We go against them in its asal. And some, I said we go against them in the what? In the wasf, in the description, in the way that we do it. So we have asl, we mukhalafatul asli, and we have mukhalafatul wasfi. Mm. In opposition to the asal of this thing, and I gave the example of like you know, Christmas, for example, or New Year's. This is bad. Mm. And then we've got less worse than it, which is it's sanctioned in our religion, but we have to disagree with them eh, in the way that we do, which is wasf. And I gave you the hadith. The issue of fasting, for example. Fasting is something that's sanctioned for us. It's يعني, legislated for both, both of us. But we come here and we, we go against them because of the suhoor. Mm. Mm -hmm. This one, if you don't do the suhoor and then you just fast, just like the way they did it, يعني, it's less than the one that the asal we don't even do. Yeah. And even worse than that, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions, is issues which are يعني, kufriyat. Hmm. And there's a extensive hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's يعني, come from يعني, he, specifically the issue of imitating them in issues which are kufr. So this hadith Abdullah ibn Umar in Radiallahu Ta'ala Anuma he narrated it marfuhan where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Bu'ithu bayna yaday sa'ati bisayfi hatta yu'bad Allahu wahda. 
I was sent out with the Prophet Sallallahu said with the sword just before the hour. حتى يعبد الله وحده لا شريك له until Allah Tabarak wa Taala is worshipped and He's not associated partners with. وجعل رزقي تحت ذل رمحي the Prophet said my provision has been placed under my spear. يعني the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's يعني provision was taken he took his risk from the ghanaim spoils of war sallallahu alayhi wasallam he wasn't taking it from any other means okay then he said sallallahu alayhi wa ju'ila dhillatu was sagaru ala man khalafa amri humility and the word as sagaru the scholars they mention ibn athir in his nihayat fi gharib al-hadith he says that was sagaru means adhul wal hawan it means yani allah humiliated them by them giving the jizya على من خالف أمري ومن تشبه بقوم فهو منهم anyone who imitates a people he's from them and so this hadith really shows us something which is anyone who imitates a people hadith by the way uh, Ibn Abi Shayba narrated it in his Musannaf Ahmad narrated it in his Musnad Abd ibn Humayd narrated it Tahawi in his Mushkil al-Athar Abu Sa'id ibn al-Arabi narrated it al-Harawi fi dhamil kalam and all those six great imams narrated it's Bukhari. authentic it's authentic yeah Bukhari narrated also in his Sahih Mu'allaqan uh, but he narrated the last sentence which is mm. and he mentions that last sentence Bukhari also narrated it like that Abu Dawood also narrated the last sentence as well the point is the hadith is sahih many great scholars have authenticated it Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he said this hadith is sanad is very good Hafid al-Iraqi who is the teacher of Ibn Hajar he said, Sanaduhu Sahih, the chain is authentic. Half of Ibn Hajar, he said, Sanaduhu Hassan. And he also said that Ibn Hibban authenticated. He mentions that in his Bulul Maram. He mentions that Ibn Hibban Sahihahu. And there are four companions who narrated it Abdullah ibn Umar, Abu Huraira, Anas ibn Malik, and Hudayfa ibn al Yaman. All of them narrated it. The riwayah of Abu Huraira, of course, is Mursal. Even though the half of Ibn Hajar graded it to be Hassan, Anas ibn Malik is one. It's also weak because there's Bishr ibn Hussein, Hudayfa ibn al Yaman, and Haytham. Haytham he mentions Rijal with Thiqat, except Ali ibn Ghurab. Mm. Um, so, this hadith, in it, there's something I need to take from it, which is anyone who imitates a people is from them. Mm. And this is an aslun min usuli hadi mas'ala. This mas'ala that we're talking about is one of the most powerful points. Shaykh al Islam Taymiyyah says, وَهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَقَلُّ أَحْوَالِهِ The minimum, bare minimum we can say about this part of the hadith وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ The bare minimum we can say is أَقَلُّ أَحْوَالِهِ أَنْ يَقْتَضِي تَحْرِيمَ التَّشَبُّهِ بِهِمْ The bare minimum is that it's haram for you to imitate the non-Muslims وَإِنْ كَانَ ظَاهِرُ Even though, though from the apparent يَقْتَضِي كُفْرَ الْمُتَشَبِّهِ بِهِمْ how can he say that the bare minimum is that it's haram? He mentions it after that. He says, he mentions, he goes on to say it. Okay. He says, وَإِن كَانَ ظَاهِرُ يَقْتَضِي الْكُفْرَ الْمُتَشَبِّهِ بِهِمْ Even though from the apparent, it does seem like yeah. it's leading towards that direction. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, okay, he brings an ayah to support it. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Anyone who takes them disbelievers as allies is very really what? From them. Yeah. Shaykh al-Islam Taymi, he then says, after he said, he mentioned many, he says, فَقَدْ يُحْمَلُ هَذَا عَلَى الْمُطْلَقِ this hadith is referring to the general imitation, يعني unrestrictedly. فَإِنَّهُ يُجِبُ الْكُفْرَ وَيَقْتَضِي تَحْرِيمَ أَبْعَاضِ ذَلِكَ وَقَدْ يُحْ وَقَدْ يُحْمَلُ عَلَى أَنَّهُ صَارَ مِنْهُمْ فِي الْقَدْرِ الْمُشْتَرَكِ الَّذِي شَابَهَهُمْ فِيهِ. This is the point I went from it. فَإِنْ كَانَ كُفْرًا أَوْ مَعْصِيَةً أَوْ شِعَارًا لِلْكُفْرِ أَوْ لِلْمَعْصِيَةِ كَانَ حُكْمُهُ كَذَلِكَ وَبِكُلِّ حَالٍ فَهُوَ يَقْتَضِي التَّشَبُّهِ بِهِمْ بِعِلَّةِ كَوْنِهِ تَشَبُّهًا. Powerful point. If the person imitates the non-Muslims in a matter which is kufr, then he takes the same ruling as him. Okay. And that was the question you asked. Yeah, it was. I was going to ask Yeah. Exactly. If he imitates them in an issue which is sin, of course, it, it becomes a sin. He imitates the non-Muslims by drinking alcohol. He goes if, he, if he imitates them in something good, like, then it gets a reward? If, if it's, yes, of course. If it's some good, something good that they did, and it's يعني, مكارم الأخلاق, a good matters, لا شك ولا ريب, you get rewarded for it if it's something good. And if it's permissible, like we're talking like about... Like you mentioned, always remember that issues which are good are always either directly or generally mentioned by our religion. يعني وقولوا للناس حسنا Say good to the people. And so, a non-Muslim showed you how to do that. لا بس. You take it from him because it goes at the عمومات okay. 
Okay. No, but no problem in that. Uh, and if some, if like you said earlier, that obviously we can't copy them or follow them in things that are specific and known to them. What if that thing that is specific and known to them is something permissible? For example, why mm-hmm. can't why can't, why don't why are you saying that is haram when this hadith would mean that it's permissible? So something. Repeat that question one more time. Let's just say something is specific to them, and the whole culture, everybody agrees it's specific to them. Nobody's disagreeing with this that. This issue is specific to them. This no, this is known for the as for non Muslims. Okay. But it's something permissible. Yeah, I'm not good be. at examples either. It's, it can't be if it's specific to them. It can't be something permissible. It's not part of their religion, for example. But it's a worldly issue that they're only known it's for. It's a worldly issue. It can't that be permissible. It can't be permissible. It's a worldly issue that only they're known for. Yeah, that's the whole argument. Like for example, this, let's just say. It's really hard to find examples, but uh, there is no example. That's why. <laughs> that's why it's hard. Yeah. Let's just say there's a particular field of study that only the non-Muslims go into. Particular field of science. I, I'm, sh- I'm struggling to find an example. Yeah, that, that, that well, I'm, I'll tell you why I'm struggling to find an example because I can't think of anything that's specifically known to them apart from religious stuff. The, you said that even from the dunya, something specific to them. Yeah. What? Give me an example. What is specifically known to them? So I have my my question to you is that. The priest, what he wears, is yeah. that a religious thing? Like what he puts, like the thing that the priest wears? Yeah, it must be because it's only the priest who wears it, not the normal layman Christians. I like to argue and say just because the priest wears it doesn't make it religious. It's something, yes, you're right, it's known for the priest to wear it. It's like the ulama, what they wear in Saudi Arabia. Mm. They're known to wear that type of clothing. The bisht, by the way, I, I, I remember I was in the haram one time and I, I liked it and I thought about wearing it. And then I wore it, it was in the Kaaba, and my thobe, the bisht, I had everything. I, you know, I like the culture and I wanted to dress like that. So a person pulled me over because, you know, in the haram, there's people who answer questions and they generally wear those yeah. clothing. So a few people, not one, a few people came running to me and asked me, uh, we have a question, can, can you answer this question? What's the ruling in this issue? I did tawaf and I left this and I left that. And I started to see, realize, oh, it's a bit serious. I'm... I'm I'm calling for something. I'm 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 asking for 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 people to come and ask me questions. But no one would say that this clothing that the ulama are wearing, or the Saudi scholars wear, no one would say that it's it's a religious thing. It's just yeah, that's clothing. not a religious issue. It's just become known to to so be their clothing. Anything I bring to you, if it's uniquely known by the Christians, you're just going to be it's a religious issue. That's what you're going to flip it to. Mm. But yeah, difference between Christians and priests. Obviously, priests are like if it was uniquely known to the yeah, I understand what you're saying. Even if it was uniquely known to the Christians, then I would say it's probably a religious thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my that's and hence that's why it does become something, you know, they consider it. But I don't think the clothing he wears is a legislation from their religion. I don't know. By the way, I'm just okay speaking from the top of my mind. Yeah. If anybody knows other than that, they can bring it to my to our attention. But the point I'm trying to say is that what really concerns me personally is not the example. What concerns me more is the principle. Because okay. when the example comes to me, wherever it comes to me from, if after this podcast I come to know about an example, I would bring yeah. it back to this, this general principle. Okay, so what about the first part of the hadith then? Because that's quite controversial. The Prophet is saying that he is sent, he has been sent to um, kill people until they believe in La ilaha illallah. So your concern is the first part of the hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as you know, he went through stages in his in his in his life. Alayhi salatu wasallam. There was the first part which was Mecca, and there was a part where he was sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina. The Medinian part is different to the Meccan part, hmm. and the Medinian part was that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi had strength and he had power and he had ability. Alayhi salatu wasallam. Now he was able to defend himself. Alayhi salatu wasallam. He was not only able to defend himself, but he was able to spread his message. Okay. Wasalam. And so when he came to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at Medina, the stage that he was at when he mentioned this hadith, was the stage where he could spread Islam. And if the person didn't want to take Islam, they had another choice, which was there was an amount of money that they had to pay. Okay. And I don't think anybody in his right mind would argue that that is unjust. A sensible person I'm talking mm-hmm. about. Right now, if you wanted to be uh, in a certain country, for example, you would have to pay tax in that country. Yeah, correct. And so that's, the tax makes you eligible for many things. Mm-hmm. You get pension from it when you grow older. Your tax gets turned into pension. Mm. Benefits come from it. So this non-Muslim... 
the jizya he pays is for his protection. He's taken care of. Yani, he was told to take Islam and he wouldn't have to pay that. If he chooses otherwise, he pays jizya. And I think we're probably going to have another podcast on that where we dissect that a bit more. But the reason why I ask the question is, why then aren't you consistent in this hadith? And the last part of the hadith, وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Why can't you say that if the Muslims are in a land where they are, Islam is prevalent, it's a Muslim country, for example, I then I agree with you, he shouldn't imitate the non-Muslims. But if he's in the UK where he's weaker now and it's a different kind of period it's a different context then why can't he imitate the non-Muslims then and be consistent with the first part of the hadith there's, because there's two mas'ala you're talking about you're talking about mas'ala to jihad which is a totally different mas'ala from the issue of tashabu bil kufar it's been brought together here just because something has been brought together doesn't mean that both of these issues talk about the same point it doesn't necessarily mean the case وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمِ فَوَمِنْهُمْ is a jumla مُنْفَصِلَ it's a sentence by itself independent from the previous sentence, it stands by itself as, an, as a sentence. وَمَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمِ فَوَمِنْهُمْ لَكِنْ بُعِثْتُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ سَاعَةِ بُعِثْتُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ السَّاعَةِ بِسَيْفِ This is uh, talking about the concept of jihad. And we know, as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, that the ayat that came down in Mecca, and Allah says, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ قِيلَ لَهُمْ كُفُوا أَيْدِيَهُمْ وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَيْتُوا الزَّكَ that once it was said to them, Kufu aidiyakum, you know, hold back your hands. Wa Hold back your hands, establish the prayer, give the zakat, don't fight. That was what was said in Mecca. Also, what was said in Mecca is Turn away from the, the ignorant ones, and you don't fight back. That was what was said in Mecca. And then when Medina came, Allah says, That was the second stage where they were told to defend themselves. And then after that came the ayah, So what we need to do is, all of those verses Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah says, it revolves around the reality of the Muslims. When the Muslims are weak, they are incompetent, they don't have the strength, they don't have the physical strength and they don't have the spiritual uh, physical uh, spiritual sp- mm-hmm. uh, strength yeah. they go back to the ayats that came down in Mecca which is alam tar ila alladhina qila lahum kuffu aydiyakum hold back your hands aqimu as-salah wa atu az-zakah pray the salah establish the zakat ama khud al-'afwa wa amur bil 'urf wa arid 'an al-jahilin command the good turn away from the ignorant people just mind your own business now okay uh, but when you get strength of course you go back you go to those verses that came down Okay, let's talk about celebrations now, which is the next part of this podcast that I want to dissect. So obviously the first one that we should be mentioning, I suppose, uh, because of the relevance for this particular week that this episode is going out on, is Christmas. Um, many Muslims will argue the fact that Christmas is no longer a religious celebration. It's actually a commercial celebration. It's Muslims are living in the West, for example, and it's really just... Uh, kind of something fun for the kids. There's no really, there's no real religious connotation left anymore. On that basis, are they allowed to celebrate Christmas? Christmas was never a, a religious celebration. You have to understand that it wasn't. It's not part of Christianity. Okay. The um, it was introduced by the um, the uh, church fathers. They introduced the celebration. It has nothing to do with Christianity as a religion. Okay. And it falls under is what they 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 innovated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was never a a, a religious thing. So Atheist no, uh, atheists celebrated, true, true. but it's something distinctly known for them. It is something which okay. is uniquely known for them. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us in a hadith, alayhi salatu wasallam. He said, This hadith is mutawatir. And Imam al-Bukhari narrated it in his sahih in two places. The first one he narrated it in uh, Kitab uh, Al-Anbiya uh, in the chaptering of Babu Madhukir and Bani Israel. And also an Imam Muslim narrated it in Al-I'tisam bis sunnah in the chapter in that Nawawi gave it, which is Babu Qawli Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam La tatba'unna sanana man kana qablakum And an Imam Muslim also narrated it in his Sahih 
in Kitab al Ilm, Bab al Tiba'i, Sunan al Yahudi wal Nasara. All of them narrated in Bukhari al Muslim, Min Tariq Zayd ibn Aslam, An Ata ibn Yasar, An Abi Sa'id al Khudri, Radiallahu ta'ala. This hadith has come, Yani, Haddu Tawatur. It's mutawatir. It's multitude narration. Um, Sanani, Amir Sanani mentions that it's mutawatir. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Latatabi'unna. There's two ways of saying it. You can say you can say By the way, as a side benefit, it was the asr of the word was tatbauna. That's how it used to be. So then lamu tawkid was put into it. Lamu tawkid was put before it tataba. So it was it was tatbauna. About tatbauna. Sorry, tatbauna. The original was tatbauna. Ah, tatbauna was a word. Tatbauna was a word. La mutawkid was put into it. La, which is to emphasize on it, which takes the place of wallahi, the Prophet swearing by Allah. And then the wow in there has a what? Sukun, right? The tatbauna. The wow has a sukun on it. Then the noon was made a shedda, noon which has a shedda on it, which is noon tawkid and mutakal. What's going to happen? Noon to tawkid mutakal. It's two noons, right? Mm-hmm. So the first noon has a sukoon and the second noon has a fatha. Iltiqa sakinain happened here. The wa was dropped out of the word. Mm-hmm. So it became latatabi'unna ama latatba'unna. Both ways it can be said. Um, so this word, the Prophet is swearing by Allah. Salawatullahi wa salamun alayhi. You will follow sanana man kana qablakum. Ibn Hajar and Nawawi, they chose the best pronunciation to be Sanana. It can also be Sunan man kana qablakum, like in Sanan is what they chose. Also, Al Muhallab strengthened that view as well because of the mentioning of shira, sh, uh, Shibran bi Shibrin wa Dira'an bi dira, which means span by span and cubit by cubit. Huh? Mm-hmm, yeah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions, and this is min mu'jizat al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the mu'jizat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is. حتى لو you follow them span by span, cubit by cubit. حتى لو دخلوا جحر ضب to the extent that if they enter the hole of a lizard, the Prophet said let تبعتموهم you will follow them. قيل يا رسول الله the Sahaba they said oh messenger of Allah, al Yahud wal Nasara. Also يجوز الضم you can say al Yahud wal Nasara. The Prophet then said فمن يعني this is استفهام بمعنى الإنكار يعني who else Mm-hmm. Who else? The companions asked, is it the Jews and the Christians? And the Prophet said, who else? Ay, naam. As if to say, of course. Of same. course. That's what the Sahabas were saying. So this hadith shows us in the hadith again, Rahul, you know, the hadith was narrated by يعني, Sahihain, Bukhari and Muslim both narrated it. So there's no doubt about its authenticity. But there's also Abu Huraira, yeah. which Bukhari also narrated separately. Rahimahullah, rahmatan, wasi'a. Okay, so I actually have the, the other wording from Abu Huraira. And uh, it says, لا تقوم لا تقوم الساعة حتى تأخذ أمتي بأخذ القرون قبلها. And now this is something crucial because I've got a couple of questions on this. It's a similar kind of hadith that is talking about. It goes on to say the same thing that you just said, but crucially it says the hour will not be established until my ummah, ummati, as in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's ummah, will follow the will copy the deeds of the previous nations. And my question is. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is actually saying here that the whole of his ummah are going to end up copying the previous nations. How do you reconcile that with the fact that we also know from another hadith that there was always going to be part or a group from his ummah that is upon the truth? This hadith that you mentioned, and Imam al-Bukhari alone narrated, Muslim didn't narrate it with him. Hadith Abu Hurairah that you mentioned, yeah. the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying, "La taqoom al-saatu." حتى تأخذ أمتي بأخذ القرون قبلها شبرا بشبر وذراعا بذراع قيل يا رسول الله كفارس والروم قال The Prophet then said ومن ومن الناس أما ومن الناس sorry إلا أولئك This hadith by the way is authentic and is صحيح How do you reconcile that with the hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم where he said لا تزال طائفة من أمتي ظاهرين حتى يأتيهم and the other wording where the Prophet said, so the first one was uh, the riwayah which was narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. لا يزال the Prophet said طائفة من أمته ظاهرين حتى يأتيهم أمر الله وهم ظاهرون. أما the hadith 
مسلم اوني نريتد ويتش از لا تزال طائفه من امتي قائمه بامر الله لا يضرهم من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم حتى ياتي امر الله وهم ظاهرون ان ذا ورينج علي وهم ظاهرون على الناس 40 صحابه نريتد ذس ذير از نو كونتراديكشن لا ذس لا تقوم الساعه حتى تاخذ امتي مينز ذا ماجورتي اوف ماي امه ذا اوفرواميل ماجورتي اوف ماي امه are going to follow the non-Muslims. That's not what the Prophet said. He said Ummati. He didn't say majority. We, If we have a general statement and we have a specific, mm. we, we have to try to reconcile it. Always remember, mm. We have to always try to bring the two evidences together. That we have to say, لا يزال طائفة من أمتي ظاهرين حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم ظاهرون حب خارج مسلم بث نريت إن أواري مسلم نريت لا تزال طائفة من أمتي قائمة بأمر الله لا يضر من خذلهم ولا من خالفهم أو من أو خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم ظاهر وهم ظاهرون على الناس. This two narrations is specific. Hmm. And then we have لا تقوم الساعة الحديث عن أبو هريرة حتى تأخذ أمتي بأخذ القرون قبلها. We have to try to bring it together. Okay. So the, the, the jama is done uh, in, in that way. Okay. Now. There's a second part of the hadith. That when you went on to, to narrate <coughs> the full hadith of Abu Huraira, towards the end, it actually says where the companions say, Oh, Rasulullah, Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you mean, i.e. by those nations, the Persians and the Byzantines? Mm-hmm. Whereas in the first hadith, you said, the companions asked, do you mean the Jews and the Christians? How is that not a contradiction then? By the way, this hadith has been narrated in three wordings. One is the one we mentioned in the beginning, which is Al-Yahud wa Nasara, the Christians and the Jews. Okay. The second narration is uh, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Kafarisa wa Rum. And there's another one which Ibn Abbas narrated, radiyallahu ta'ala anhumah, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, where he said, لَتَرْكَبُنَّا سَنَنَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ شِبْرًا بِشِبْرٍ وَذِرَاعًا بِذِرَاعٍ حَتَّى لَوْ أَنَّ أَحَدَهُمْ دَخَلَ حُجْرَ جحرة سوري ضب حتى لو دخل جحرة ضب لا دخلتهم the prophet said وحتى لو أن أحدهم جامع أمه بالطريق لفعلتموه حاكم narrated that in his مستدرك and also الشيخ ناصر رحمه الله authenticated it the habi agreed with it بزار also authenticated مناوي also authenticated this one this one ابن عباس is one is general okay is general it's saying that قبلكم, you will follow the path of those who came before you. Okay. It doesn't mention who. Fair enough. Then the one I mentioned, Abis, Hadith Abi Sa'id al Khudrina, yeah. it mentions Al Yahud wal Nasara. Correct. Jews uh, and the Christians. And Jews and the Christians. And the third one is Al Rum wal Fars. Yani Al Rum wal Faris. Now, how do we reconcile between that? It's very simple. There are some explanations Hafiz Mahajar mentions in Fatul Bari that Karmani, what he said, in his Karmani is one of the Shurrah of Bukhari, what he mentioned, that this is Anahu ala sabili tamthil, that this is just an example, because the hadith, what did he say? Karroom wal fari, sah? Yes. What is the wording hadith say for you? Yeah. Uh, the hadith of Abu Hayra. Kafaris wal rum. Kafaris wal rum, right? So the kaf in there, what is what? Like, like, like. Like. Yeah. But what? I don't think that's convincing. Yeah. The, the reason it's not convincing is because the Prophet at the end, what he said, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ إِلَّا أُولَيْكَ Yeah, correct. Yeah. Who is the people except? Yeah. The Prophet mm-hmm. at the end, he said, وَمِنَ النَّاسُ إِلَّا أُولَيْكَ وَمَنِ النَّاسُ وَمَنِ النَّاسُ Who are the people إِلَّا أُولَيْكَ except exactly. these people? Yeah. So it can't be tashbih or tamthil. So anyways, the, the, that which seems apparent when Ilmu Indallah is that this falls under what the Usuliyin call At-Tansisu ala ba'd al-Afradi bi-dhikri. التنصيص على بعض الأفراد العام بذكر If I say for example Muhammad stand up And I say everybody stand up Muhammad stand up They don't contradict one another mm. True Just because you narrow down The the one we say من كان قبلكم حديث من عباس is general And the hadith that mentions the Christians and the Jews and the Romans and the Persians is just It's a tansisu It's part of the group It's part of the group Ala ba'di afraad al-aami bi-dhikri Sahib al-Maraqi he says Wada'a dhamir al-ba'di wal-asbaba Wa dhikra ma wafaqahu min mufradi And Allah used that a lot in the Quran Wal-mutallakatu yatarabbasna bi-anfusihna Thalathata quru'in After that Allah says Wabu'ulatuhunna haqqu biraddihinna Doesn't Allah says Hafidhu ala salawati Wa salati al-wusta Yeah Wa qumu lillahi qanitin So it's common That the Quran does this kind of tariqah So I think that's inshallah ta'ala a response. It's not strong as well. It's not 100% sharp answer. Lakin, 
that which seems apparent when I'm okay. Allah. So that that's some of the technical aspects, um, the more technical as- aspects with the hadith, um, and it really shows the, the the virtue and the benefit of getting detailed Arabic language, Arabic grammar, because it can really help you exactly. um, distinguish between some of these some of these questions. However, I then want to go into the meaning of the hadith. What what exactly do you take from this? I take the, the Prophet sallallahu mentioned to us alayhi salatu wasalam, that you will follow the 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 the, the nations before you, I mean, the Christians Correct. and the Jews. Yeah. Uh, you will follow them. Shibran bi shibrin, wa dira'an bi dira'in, hatta law dakalu juhra dabbin, tabatumum. You will follow them. Yeah. Now. So it's basically a prophecy. It doesn't say it's wrong to follow them. It doesn't say you shouldn't follow them. It's just a prophecy saying that you, this will happen. Nothing wrong with it, right? Yeah, the Prophet told us, Ali Sultan, this is going to happen. This is going to take a pl- take place. There's no dispraise in it. It's not not saying you shouldn't follow them. Would no. we agree? No, no. The hadith doesn't mention it. No. Okay. Cool. Okay. Okay, um, so we're going back to Christmas then We said that You said yeah, But that there's something you're falling here into <laughs> I'm wondering why you let me pass on so Yeah, quickly. yeah, this, this, there's a point you're falling into right now Is that you're trying to take Al-Hukmul Kawni uh, Universal ruling that the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned here And you're trying to go against a legislated ruling But not in this hadith Legislated ruling elsewhere Yeah, yeah, so this, this is a universal ruling Some, Somebody might come and say, look if the Prophet Sallallahu told us like let us follow the years of those who came before you, shibran with shibran, and with shibran with shibran, even if they entered the land of the Lord, they did not enter the land of the Lord. Yours, from what you said, it can be sensed from it that you're saying that universally, this is going to happen. So why fight it? So why even argue about it? Why even yeah. if Allah wants this to happen? In other words, He said He 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 He's, He wants this. What we say is this is something that the, any before Islam. Um, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Something that they did They took the universal signs And they tried to use that To push away The Legislated You know Evidences mm. For example The non-Muslims They said They said If Allah wa ta'ala Willed We would not have Associated partners With Allah wa ta'ala mm. We wouldn't Our forefathers wouldn't you know, Allah wanted us to do this. He's pleased with us doing shirk. That's what they said. Allah mentions also, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ If they are told, give from what Allah gave you, subhanahu wa ta'ala, قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا uh, the, the disbelievers, they say, قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنُطْعِمُ مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَهُ Are we going to provide for a people Allah chose them to be poor? Mm. Again, they, they and not, don't, don't, like, don't think to yourself that they didn't uh, know that this was that this is universal and this is legislated. They knew it. They they were doing it out of stubbornness and arrogance and hard headedness. They even said, "Lo sha Allah ma abidna mi dunhi mi shay." If Allah Tabarak wa Taala did not will, we would not have worshipped anybody other than Him. We say that's haq, That's true. You're right. Everything in this world happens bi bi mashiati Allahi Tabarak wa Taala. Okay. Yeah. All of it happens bi mashiati Allahi Tabarak wa Taala. And Allah even mentions that subhanahu wa ta'ala He says If we willed we would have given every soul his guidance mm. uh, uh, we, we believe that But the question here is It's a statement which is true But it's intended from it evil Okay Because we know Allah wa ta'ala is not pleased with kufr Allah wa ta'ala he says Allah is not pleased subhanahu wa ta'ala Disbelief for his people In no way shape or form So we're not going to anyway Yani accept a person to take a universal sign to kind of repel a shari. Okay. The Prophet is telling us here something that's going to happen which is not good. The Prophet وسلم, he said to us in another hadith, لا تقوم الساعة The hour will not strike صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى تضرب until the, the legs of a woman of the people of Dos goes to the khalas an idol that was worshipped at that time. And he pay attention to this. لا تقوم الساعة حتى تضرب أليات بني أدوس على ذي خلاص أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. The hour will not strike until a woman or the people will go to the idol of the خلاص. The خلاص is an idol that was worshipped that was destroyed. Okay, this is going to happen. People are going to revive this again. The point I'm trying to take from this is a universal sign. The Prophet said this is going to happen. True. People are going to go back to ibadatul asnam, worshiping idols. Does that mean Allah is pleased with us worshipping idols? No, in no way, shape, not. or form. Okay. So the Prophet prophesied it. 
Okay. Uh, so going back to Christmas, you said Christmas is not a religious holiday for, that, for the Christians. And you said, obviously, it was never like that. And even now it's not like that. Atheists will celebrate Christmas, etc. But you said we still, as Muslims, can't celebrate it. And the reason for that is because it is known for the non-Muslims. And I would probably agree with that. But I would like to counter that and say that if with time, because you also said previously in the podcast that if things can change over time and they don't take the original ruling, they take the ruling as of that time and that society. If over time, which we've seen actually in the last 10, 15, 20 years, Muslims do start to embrace this holiday, uh, then can we get to a stage where in maybe 100, 200 years time, it is no longer something that is unique to non-Muslims, mm -hmm. it is shared and therefore we can celebrate Christmas no. as well. Why? Because Eid are matters set on stone. What do you mean by Eid? Eid means celebration. Okay. Celebrations and festivals for Muslims is set on stone. In other words, the Prophet wasalam, when he came to the city of Medina yeah. and he saw the companions and he, uh, they told him about their celebrations that they had, the Prophet wasalam, he said to them, Inna Allah, abadalakum. Allah has exchanged for you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has what? Hmm. He's exchanged for you. Your celebrations and it, it, it changed for you means it's all of it, it, it as Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned rahimahullah ta'ala that everything that you are ce currently celebrating all of it has been eradicated yeah. and it has been changed with what? It's been changed with uh, these Eid Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr No problem Also the well, Hold on, hold on, hold on just because I've got the hadith with me as well and I, I'm not really sure what you're taking from that. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, came to Medina, the people had two days on which they engaged in f celebrations, for example. Mm -hmm. He asked, what are these two days? Like, what is the significance? They said, we used to engage ourselves on them in the pre-Islamic period. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, uh, Allah has substituted for them something better than them, the day, the day of sacrifice and the day of the breaking the fast. Inna Allah qad ab abdalakum bihima khayran minhuma. Okay, Jamil, no problem. My question is, where in this did you get the understanding that you then can't add on a third or a fourth? I'll give you a worldly example. You have two thobes for you. And I can see that they've got maybe a little bit worn out. And I say, I've replaced these two thobes for you with something better. Does that mean that I've restricted you from going out to buy a third or a fourth or a fifth? Of course not. Nothing in my wording has restricted anything. Mm. I just I replace this with two that are better. No, when the Sharia I replaced it It means we've abrogated Everything else From previous it. Correct I'm talking about New ones that come up When I replace your thobes I've taken them away I agree with you But I've not restricted you From going out to buy A third or a fourth Why did the Sharia I Substitute their celebration To a new celebration Because these celebrations Maybe have shirk in them Maybe have kufr in them The uh, same thing All the celebrations that Christmas has But right we now. just said It's not a religious celebration Which one? Christianity You said it's uh, Sorry Christmas Not a religious celebration You said that Not me And I didn't I'm not saying that it does, It's not a religious I didn't say it. I said it has shirk And wrong things Okay what it. shirk Does Christmas have in it? They're glorifying Isa ibn Maryam Okay agreed What shirk does New Year Have in it? Yeah. What shake does New Year have in it? Okay, but that first of all, we agree on Christmas. I agree with you on Christmas. No Christmas is, a, is a, by the way, when I said Christmas is not an act of, uh, it's not an act of religious, it's not part of their religion in reality. They do consider it to be part okay. of their religion. They look at it as a religious festival, but the uh, reality of the matter is we will say they introduced this, they innovated it. Araft. Yeah, okay, I understand what you're saying. But still, we would stay clear of it because it is still associated with their religion, even yeah. though it wasn't part of their religion uh, originally. Amen. It's something invented. But I still want to go on things like New Year's, anniversary, birthdays, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all permissible. And that hadith that you mentioned, to me, and again, we agreed the asal of the dunya is permissibility. And that hadith that you mentioned has not restricted them. From Issues of ayat celebrations are matters of religion. It's mm -hmm. seen as a matter of religion. The, the Eid Eid, Eid okay. yeah, is an act of uh, Ibadah Eid al-Fitr Eid, Eid al -Adha, Yeah totally I agree with you No Eid The concept of Eid Celebration in Islam Is an act of uh, uh, A repetition of You know the word Eid Comes from the word Ada Okay it comes that keeps repeating Islam is set for us Yeah and it just it's, Every celebration That was there By the way When the Prophet Was talking to Quraysh He's also talking to Everybody who was In the other side of the world even he's telling them these are the only two that you guys have. Yeah. And he's talking to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anyone to come after. 
You can't restrict His statements are not only restricted to the people He's talking to He's talking to everybody who comes later Yeah, and we agree with the statement that He replaced those two with two new ones so Quraysh, nothing in the statement said that uh, you can't In other words, more. what He's saying to them is The word is Sariha from the Prophet He's trying to say to them is What was there has been removed Correct And now what has taken its place In other words, everything has been abrogated Everything from before has been abrogated. No problem yeah, with you. Yeah, been abrogated. One of the ma'ani that the word nasq in Arabic language has, the word mansukh, what does that mean? Abrogated. From the wordings that it has inside it is al badal. It's to change substitute. something. Yeah, okay. a substitute. Yeah. That's the word that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used, yeah. which is that he substituted sallallahu alaihi wasallam for them. Yeah. Everything, everything from before. I'm with you. Not just before. Is لُنذِرَكُمْ بِهِ وَمَنْ بَلَغَ That qaid is general. It's for those to come as well. He's not. He's talking to these people as the Arabs. They say, "Iyaka wa'ani wasmaiya jara." He's talking to these people. He's talking to the companions that are sitting in front of him, and he's also discussing with those to come. But to abrogate something by default, that by the definition of the word, or to substitute, or to replace, however you want to term it, by default, that is talking about something that already exists. By the way, also the. Yeah, it can't be talking about future things which don't exist yet. That's not abrogation. That's not substitution. That's not replacement. The the the. the it's not abrogation, you're right. But if it comes after, the person has to be in line with this. That's what he was meant to be with. He must have took something and added onto it. Do you understand my point? Someone on the lie on the way had to add something onto celebration that the Prophet never sanctioned in the first place. So what we know as Muslims is that we only have two celebrations. Shaykh Rasam Tima Rahimallah in his kitab Iqtida Sarat al-Mustaqim al-Mukhalifati Ashab al Jahim. This is one of the points that he stuck on deeply and discussed it strongly. So I can't recall it all Like uh, I never brought it with me as well That, But Sheikh Samdi has a nice bath on this issue on the Okay Okay Okay. And so what about the argument that this is talking about Islamic celebrations Whereas going out for dinner on your birthday is nothing to do with Islam And it's not and It's not. In fact let's, let's, uh, let's get rid of that even And let's just say a non-recurring event Let's just say I graduated from university. Can I go out and celebrate that graduation? Am I allowed to do that? The issue of birthday, remember, it's a reoccurring thing, so it's not going to happen once. So okay. That's a reoccurring, get rid of that. As for other than one or something happened good in your life and you want to celebrate it, and then it's not Eid. That doesn't take the term Eid, it just takes a hafla. We give it other namings. Eid is something that key re- keeps reoccurring. Keeps... Now, for example, your son finished the Quran and you celebrate, and it's what Malik used to do that, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Like in a reoccurring yearly thing that the person keeps doing, it falls under the hadith I was just going to mention before. Uh, the hadith that Imam Al Bukhari narrated in his Sahih in the Bab of Man Talaba Dam Imrin Bi Ghayr Haqin, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hadith Ibn Abbas radiyallahu taala anhu ma abghadu nasi ila Allahi thalathatun. The most hated people to Allah are three. Mulhid fi al Haram. The word Al Mulhid in the Arabic language it means Al Ma'il an al Haq. It's like the ayah, وَمَنْ يُرِيدِ بِإِلْحَادٍ بِظُلْمٍ نُذِقُهُ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ وَمَنْ يُرِيدِ فِيهِ بِإِلْحَادٍ إِلْحَاد means الْمَائِلُ عَنِ الْحَقِّ أَمَا الْمَائِلُ عَنِ الْقَصْدِ Some scholars mention that as well. It's someone who's diverted from the truth. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith, three are most hated to Allah Taala. A person who wants to be corruption and harm to the haram. Okay. The second one is, وَمُبْتَغِينَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ سُنَّةِ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ Which is the issue of, yeah, bringing a pre-Islamic ignorant you know practice and that person tries to bring it into islam that's what the person yani man yuridu baqa asirat al jahiliya someone who wants you know jahiliya practices to mm. remain within islam okay but it's something very important you said mubtaghin fil islam so those these people are these pe- a lot of people are bri- because remember i told you already the concept of eid is an islamic practice the two Eids are 100% Islamic. No, it's we do as a Eid is Islamic. Eid is a, it's a religious practice. What makes you think that? Like, for example, you're talking about Eids outside of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. What, yeah. what, 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 how can you say it's Islamic? The Prophet ﷺ, when he said that, oh, Muslims, every Eid, these are the only two you, that's been given to you guys. In other words, you're only allowed these two. Anyone who says, I have a third one on Messenger of Allah to add to, or I've got a fourth one to add on to, يعني, يعني, you have to bring evidences for that. Or else what the, you're the doing asal, is The asal of the dunya is mubakh We already decided We already agreed that We said Eid, is not, has not, Eid re- is not Issues of the dunya That's what we already said We took that out Remember but the how, beginning uh, Our conditions yeah. when we mentioned I said to you The matters of A'yad The concepts of A'yad Are matters which are 
textually based. They're not ijtihadat, they're not independent reasoning, there's not a person looking into issue. If you bring a Eid, then it means you're bringing it into Islam, because it's a religious issue. Wa mubtaghin fil islami sunnat al jahiliyyah. Okay. Wa mutallibu dami mri'in bi ghayri haqqi li yuhriqa dama. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of Imam al-Bukhari, he narrated it. He narrated it from his teacher, Abu al-Yaman al-Hakam ibn Nafi' in al-Bahrani, who narrated from Shu'ayb ibn, ibn Hamza al-Umawi, who narrated from Abdullah ibn Abi al-Husayn al-Makki al-Nawfaliyu, who narrated from Nafi' ibn Jubayr ibn Mut'im, and who narrated from Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So you're saying people who celebrate the birthdays are from the most hated people to Allah? I know. Okay. Um, there's another... And it's powerful because it's been it's, it's been mentioned un, under a person who wants to bring harm to the Kaaba. Mm. You know, somebody who's trying to. Some of the scholars they said, "Man fa'al al-ma'asiyati wa fil haram." Someone who does sins in the haram okay. and doesn't observe the hurma of the makan that he is in, then the ayah takes him. وَمَنْ يُرِدْ فِيهِ بِالْحَادِ بِظُلْمٍ نُذِقُهُ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ. So within this principle, obviously, comes anniversaries. Anything that's reoccurs on an annual basis, or not just an annual, it could reoccur every. Six months or something like that. What if someone says, like, I work in an office and every Wednesday, every first Wednesday of the month, we go out for dinner celebrations. That's, that comes into this hadith now? So repeat that again. I work in an office. And right. just as a team building kind of thing, we say first Wednesday of every month, ah. we go out for dinner as a celebration. So it's not restricted to a particular date. It's, 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 yes, it is. It's a, a first Wednesday of every single month. Yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? No, it's not difficult. It's not actually not difficult. I'm just saying that I don't see that as to be an Eid. Yeah, but why can you say that and not, no, but and Eid, not say that about anniversary? Eid, Eid, I'll tell you what it is. An anniversary, you can bring an example and then you bring another example here. I'm just trying to show you there are differences as well that you need to observe. Anniversaries, for example, is a particular date, not day, date. There is a particular date on the 27th of February. You're always going to, that's my, that's, it's, that's Muhammad. Okay, the second one is a person has, uh, you know, birthday. It's on the first of January is the day I was born because my love Somalis are born on the first of January. <laughs> <laughs> the first of January, for yeah. example, you're celebrating on the first of January. That date it reoccurs. Okay, Christmas is on the twenty fifth of uh, December. Yeah, stuck to that date. Okay, you're going to celebrate it. Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha is stuck to a date. So on a particular date. Are you with me? Yeah, in, a, in the Islamic calendar, obviously. In the Islamic calendar. Yeah. Now, pay attention here. But me celebrating the finishing of the Quran is not a particular date. It can happen any time. I don't have control over that. You but see? I say to my team in the office, on the 4th of every month, the 4th of November, 4th of December, 4th yeah. of January, 4th, that's it. Yeah, that's problematic. You're now. making it very difficult on the people. We're not allowed to see. In Islam, in Islam, Celebrations, by the way, um, uh, that particular surah. I need to th really think deep about it. Okay, but I'm saying it's different from my that argument. particular example, like surah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being, being in yeah that I need to look into and I think about it. But the point I'm trying to focus on right now, and I really want to keep my focus on and not get distracted by, is that which we're seeing people do. I was born in these days, so I want to yeah. celebrate it. No, it's not allowed. Okay, I understand. There's one other doubt and question that people bring about this particular hadith. And that is that this is talking about a communal celebration for, and it clearly says, Kunna nalabu. We used to play on these particular days. The Prophet replaced it with two. These are communal, as in the whole of the Muslims celebrate the two Eids. Okay. A birthday is not a communal celebration, it's just me and my family. Me and my wife's anniversary. That's a community, this is, though. This is me and my wife and my anniversary. This is not something that is for the whole Muslims. We're not legislating across okay, the whole who Muslims. Said that? Who said that from the early scholars of Al Islam? Mm. Yeah, anyone can say what they want. Anybody who says something, who brings a point. But the, the asal is mubah. Why are you bringing it into this? No, I just said to you, Eid, no. Eid, I said to you, no. Mm. Celebrations, no. Islam sets it on set, 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 set on stone. Okay. Okay, that covers New Year, Valentine's Day, birthdays, anniversaries, etc. The next thing I want to move on to is haircuts. Okay. Another controversial topic that many say, are we allowed to imitate a non-Muslim's haircut? For example, a football player has a particular kind of haircut, looks good, I want to do the same. You see, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he observed the outer appearance. Our outer appearance in Islam, don't you think to yourself that the Prophet never made sure he looked at his Sahabas? Not just the, can I just 
even go to the women and then come back to the men as well or the men the however you want to do it i want to show you this is both sides okay humid ibn abdul rahman ibn awf and he said i heard muawiyah ibn abi sufyan radiyallahu ta'ala anhum may allah be pleased with him and his father amu hajj amu hajj uh muawiyah radiyallahu anhu he went on the pulpit yani sa'ad al manbar he went on to the member and he started to talk then what he did was Muawiyah وَتَنَاوَلَ قُصَّةً مِّن شَعْرٍ He took a portion of hair كَانَتْ فِي يَدِ حَرَسِيًّ which was in, was, was in the hand of, of one of the haras. He said, give it to me. And he said, يَا أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ or the people of Medina and who says Muawiyah رضي الله عنه saying this he said, يَا أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ أَيْنَ عُلَمَاءُكُمْ Where are your scholars? سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ يقول, I heard the Prophet saying إِنَّمَا هَلَكَتْ بَنُوا إِسْرَائِيلَ بَنُوا إِسْرَائِيلَ destroyed حين اتخذ هذه نساءهم. When their women took these fake hairs. Mm. And Imam uh, Ahmed narrated this. Bukhari is two riwayah that it came through. First riwayah, Ahmed narrated it. Abu Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi ibn Majah and Nasai. Uh, and uh, not ibn Majah, like Nasai and Watta. All of them narrated it from the chain of Ibn Shihab al-Zuri and Humayd ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Awf in the Hihad Mu'awit ibn Abi Sufyani. The second one, Ahmed narrated Abu Bukhari and Muslim and Nasai min tariqi shu'bah an Amr ibn Murrah an Sa'id ibn Sayyib that Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu said the following. This hadith shows us that women are not allowed to have extension because of the chabu bil kufar. The Jews, he said. Mm. So that's for the women. As for the men, Al-Hajjad ibn Hassan, he said, دخلنا على أنس ibn Malik فحدثني. I came to, يعني, Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, and he said, قال دخلنا على Anas ibn Malik فحدثتني أختي المغيرة, my sister مغيرة, um, يعني سستر مغيرة told me قالت وأنت يومئذ غلام ولك قرناني أو قصتان فمسح رأسك وبرك عليك وقال احلقوا هذين أو قصوهما فإن هذا زي اليهودي يعني either let your whole entire hair go or cut it all don't leave some and let some go because he said فإن هذا زي اليهودي mm. this is the dressing of the Jews أبو داود narrated this in his sunan uh, رحمه الله تعالى Rahmatan wasi'ah. So, and the hadith is hasanun. Inshallah ta'ala, there are some narrators in there who's khifatul dabt, in ba'd al ruwat like in the hadith has a shahid. By the hadith al-Imam Ahmed, and Bukhari, and Muslim, and Abu Dawood, and Ibn Majah, and Nasai narrated, which is, Naha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qaza. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited us from qaza. And qaza means, somebody shaves part of the hair, and he left, leaves the other part of the, the hair. Okay, yeah. so if you see a haircut, for example, that is specific to the non-Muslims, we shouldn't be doing it. But if it's a haircut, like we discussed earlier, that is used by Muslims, non-Muslims, whatever, it's just a style. As long as it doesn't have that qaza, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next thing I want to go into is obviously me and you both born and raised in the UK. We know the situation in the UK. We know the crimes uh, that are committed in the UK. We know that much of this is related to the gang culture. And with that, there is a particular way that people speak known as slang, for example. Mm -hmm. Is it wrong for Muslims to talk in a using slang? Oh, definitely, of course. It's not just. But it's uh, not specific to the non-Muslims. This is something that the Muslims and the non-Muslims. It's non actually are doing. no slang is. It's, it's it's not just seen as non-Muslims. It's also seen as you know the fusak and the mujrimin. You're following a, a particular type of people, yani criminals and drug dealers and yani thugs. Those are the type of people you're following. Mm. Yani, uh, even even an educated person Before even a Muslim An educated person Will look down at you When you start speaking in that way You see The fact that you speak in that certain way They will look down at you Because you're putting yourself down and low So la shakka wa la It falls under the bad akhlaq That a person shouldn't have And this is Tashabbu Also for the fusaq You can't do that You can't imitate fasiqs people who are yani, criminals and thugs imitating them is not you're not allowed to do it so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said waman tashabbaha bi qaumin fa huwa minhum the said. qawm is not just jews christians no. these big groups because he also said persians and byzantines sahih, which obviously brings sahih, it down sahih. to a smaller level so even for example we see that there's a particular way of talking amongst the the gangsters or let's just say the hip hop, the, the musicians, the artists, the rap artists, even that is not allowed. That person, the same person who speaks slang, when he goes for a job or an interview or he goes places, he throws that all out of the window and he speaks with with, with, with yani, uh, standard yani, 
language. He mm. uses a standard language. So, um, by the way, a l many people use slang. Slang is not just attached to blacks or it's not just attached to Somalis or it's not attached to just Asians or whites. It's something all of the yani, yani drug dealers, criminals do, whether it be white, mm. black, Somalis, all of them, they're all in there. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all in there. They use that language. That's a the language they use. As a person who's tahir, who's clean, who's cleansed, who's yani, that, that's not what you want to, you don't want to speak like those people. How the drug dealers talk to each other when they're selling drugs to each other. Mm. You don't want to adopt that. Look, Shai, we have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right now in the world, before I mention the hadith, right now in the world that we're, we're in, is a person shaving his beard and grooming himself, is that something seen like respectful, like nice? Shaving their beard and, and grooming themselves. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's seen as something clean. Shave your beard. That's yeah, right, right? Definitely. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from imitating them in that, which they consider to be beauty and mm. color, mashallah, sharp, and you look, mashallah, tidy, and you look, you know, in shape, and everything looks good, everything looks right. You're, you're ready for the job. You looked, you look ready. Ma'adalika, the Prophet ﷺ said to the Prophet Sahabas, he said, Khalifu al Mushrikina, Wafiru al Liha, Wahfu al Shawariba. Ibn Umar, only when he would go Hajj or Umrah, he would take from his Lihya a portion of it. So, what did the Prophet ﷺ say in English? He said, Khalifu al Mushrikina, go against the Mushriks. Do what? Wafiru al Liha, let your beards grow. Wahfu al Shawariba, and shorten your, your mustache. Could that Shorten. hadith not be turned around on you right now in the 21st century where we see actually the Jews, for example, they also have gold be long beards, as do the Sikhs. Oh. So should we not start shaving our beards to be opposite from them? Remember what I said at the beginning? We might sometimes agree with them in the Aslul Hukmi, but then we will go against them in the Wasf, in the description. So the Jews, they don't, um, uh, yeah, the Jews don't let their moustache grow. Oh. So they let their moustache grow. We trim ours. We shorten our moustache. We trim it. And the Sikhs we, also let those go as well. Yeah. So we do. We, so it's like fast and ashura where you take it on, but you change it you by change adding an some, extra some tr attributes that which you have to. Uh, we are. By the way, covering women, covering up. All the, also the the the, the Orthodox the Jews they do that yeah. as well. Mm. They they do that. So we're not going to leave it for them. We're not going to leave that uh, for them. So this hadith, by the way, is sahih that Al Imam Al Bukhari narrated in his Kitab Al Libas. Muslim also narrated in his Kitab. In Tahara, Bayhaqi in Sunil Kubra, Min Tariq is Yazid ibn Zurayin. So it's authentic. Ahmed also narrated it as well. Now, is there, is there not a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari that talks about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa talking to an Ethiopian girl in her own language? Are you aware of this hadith? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa spoke to who? An Ethiopian girl in her own language. I don't remember that. Okay. I think some people use this to show that there's nothing wrong with talking about with in slang, for example, because you're just you're talking to the people in a way, and there's a principle as well, right? Like you can talk to the people in a way that they understand. So most of the people understand slang, especially people of a certain age. What's wrong with just using that kind of language around them? I haven't come across the hadith, but let's say for her argument's sake that he did. Does that mean he spoke to her in slang? Not in slang, but the the, the shahid from the hadith is that he spoke to her in her language. Hi. Well, she understood. And the kids on the street, they do they understand, understand slang much better. They're, they're accustomed to it. It's natural for them. They don't understand standard English. They probably do, but it's easier for them. They're, they're more used to slang. That's not, that's far-fetched. Okay. Mm. This is a far-fetched argument. They speak it. When they go to school, when they do their dissertations, when they do JCCs, they all speak English. But when they go sell drugs, they speak another language. Yeah. And um, if someone says I've been doing it for 25, 30 years It's just become a part of me now Should they try and fight that or just Of course, definitely Look, it's not just Look, I'm not coming at it Just from the perspective of the dean as well it's, Morally it's not even right Even It's, it's a bad reputation For the, the community and the people you're, 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 you're in Like when they see you Dressed that way Your trousers sagging You're speaking in that way I remember a teacher in my school used to say you, she, when she used to see those kids in secondary school, she would come in and she would say, you all need insurance on your trousers, on your jeans. <laughs> and you, 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 Allah is gharib jiddan. And the surah that you gave, the perception of Islam, it's, it's not pleasant. It's honestly not pleasant. So you're a da'ya. You're someone who calls to Islam. Allah making me one. I mean, put yourself in the UK. You're around people who are non-Muslims, you're trying to bring them into Islam. And we obviously know, you know, psycho psychological and 
um, techniques, for example, conversation skills, like for example, mirroring, where you copy the same body language, yeah. give that kind of relatability to yeah. one another. That, and, and uh, in da'wah, obviously, our main goal is to try and, after pleasing Allah, is to try and bring people to Islam. Mm -hmm. You want them to be able to relate to you. However, you're now saying that let's be completely different from them and let's isolate ourselves from them. Not isolating physically, but let's be, be different to that from them. Doesn't that, isn't that going to be like counterproductive to your da'wah and to bringing people to Islam? And that's why many people actually see Islam as a Pakistani religion, as an Arab religion. They don't feel like it can suit me. I'm a white British guy, for example. It doesn't really suit me because you guys are just your own culture. Can you see where I'm coming from? It's a two-edged sword. What I mean by that is that some people might even see you as a sellout by just, you know, leaving your own, your own, yani Islamic heritage and the way your religion is, and you're, 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 you're changing your name. You, your name was Harith, and you changed your name to Harris, and you now call yourself Michael because you've come to their country. And you use the argument, yeah, actually, names are not a problem. It's not, it's, it's got no bad uh, thing in there. So no problem. And you dress like them. You talk like them. All of that, even deeply, they might see you as, oh, this guy is, what's he trying to do? Stick up th this much? So I think it could be a, it's a two-edged sword. That's point number one. Point number two, um, sometimes, actually, it might even spark a nice conversation, to be honest. Oh, why are you wearing this clothes for? I, I actually like this. Where do you get this from? It happened to me in, in Toronto mm. when I landed. Yeah, a woman came up to me, an elderly woman, uh, uh, maybe a grandma, you know, she's very old. And she came up to me and she, she said, oh, hey, uh, Maya, where did you get this from? It looks very beautiful. And then from there, I just, little da'wah. That was a da'wah. And thirdly is that, uh, the UK specifically that we're both from, is yeah. a cosmopolitan city, like London specifically. It's like, that's the whole, like you see. Yeah, but you still wouldn't see many people in Thobes. Like, no, but you see Jamaicans wear their clothing. You see the Ghanaians wear their clothing. You see the Somalis wearing their clothing. You see the Asians wear shawar kameez. You see the whole city. Everyone that isn't when you look at London. I don't know about Saint Albans, <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at London, what is the clothing of London? You know, it is there isn't like this yeah. is the clothing that everyone wears. It is everyone wears what they want, and no one really like. Only a group of people have hate in their hearts, you know, animosity. You want to target Muslim women and Muslim men who know this clothing of, clothing of Muslims. They're the ones who mm. would say what they want. But I'll be honest with you. I've lived UK in, in nearly all of my life, subhanAllah. And I've never been targeted personally because of the clothing I was wearing. And I never felt a conversation came to an end because of clothing I was wearing. Mm. If anything, it starts because of the Actually, to be honest, it started. But then again... I'm not going to make my experience of course. everyone else's experience. There are people who are targeted for their clothing, what they wear, may Allah make it easy for them. I mean, and people who live in other parts of Europe where obviously it's not as multicultural, if they decide to wear jeans and a t-shirt to in for the for the sake of giving da'wah, sometimes you even, even have du'a to like giving da'wah online. Again, it's they, allowed. It's allowed. It's, it's not, allowed. No one's saying it's haram. As long as it fulfills the criteria and the obligation to cover your yeah, awrah. Yeah, it's not haram. It's, but it's... It's something I wouldn't feel comfortable. I wouldn't feel comfortable in going to uh, person. I'm not saying it's just my per per personal preference. I don't want to impose that on everybody else because my personal preference is only mine. But um, I'm saying that uh, as a Muslim, I don't know. I just as a Muslim, I wanna I wanna be different, mm. and that might mean that might mean me wearing Pakistani, you know, uh, kameez. Like mm. I prefer that way before wearing. A suit or jeans. Suit, or jeans. Suit. I prefer wearing uh, an Arab Muslim's culture clothing with ulama wear, or clothing Somalis wear, or clothing which African wear. Then you know what I mean, like yeah. then jumping on the clothing worn by yeah. any generally worn by non-Muslims. I just want to look different to them. Sure. Not that I'm saying that the Somali ma'awis that we wear is like somehow from the Prophet Ali. So Sunnah thabit ali Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but. Coming to the and um, the monkey zoo, I call it monkey zoo. Coming to the monkey zoo, don't you think to yourself that Subhanallah, some people who wear it, we could actually say that their their suits are haram because the trousers are so it's tight, too tight and, and, and yeah, and the blazer is so tight. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a potential argument. I also think that I mean, in that situation, what is someone to do when their office 
mandates upon them. You can't wear a thobe in the office in the corporate world in Canary Wharf. No, but why can't you just wear a bit, you know, like... A looser one. A bit of looser one. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, remember, the word sarawil. The word sarawil. I'm not going to sarf, right? <laughs> the word sarawil. Mm. It's... Uh, in the Arabic language, is different from the word bantalon. Oh. Trousers bantalon, where the people wear. Okay. The tight stuff they wear. Sarawi like in... It's the one you, you, you in the Indians they, they wear it as well, the Pakistanis. Yeah, yeah, I know what the you mean. Big one, the leg, yeah. the bottom, you can. It's got, but you can't wear that in the office, man. No, like, I'm saying that's that's good. That's nice. That's very nice because aura doesn't show is fat fault. It's very good. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you're gonna wear the monkey suit, make sure you it's not too tight. Because some people they come to the mystery, they pray, and then you can see their backside, sure. their outer showing it's so tight. Even when they walk, they they, they it's like they're struggling. Mm. Uh, so I'm and of course about, above the ankles as well. Right? And again, it has to be above the ankles. There are things that you have to observe. Yeah. Yeah, by the, the way, it can't be below the ankles. That's what it is. It can't be on the ankle. By the way, okay. okay. We just loosely say above the ankles. Yes, so you're right. Um, and I think just one more thing that I'd add, probably from the Dawah perspective, is that. I can actually see, and I've seen experiences uh, where people actually dress, for example, in the Islamic dress, actually are more productive in giving da'wah because there's an element of that the person who is giving da'wah to looks at him and like, you really believe in what you believe, don't you? Like it's, it's changed your whole life. Like it really affects you. And that kind of conviction that he can see in you can often be a means for him to really think about, am I really convicted about my own beliefs? That's true. Whereas that when there's someone thinks, oh, for the sake of da'wah, I'm going to wear jeans and a t-shirt so they can relate to me. They're just thinking, well, there's not really much difference between you and you and me. You know, I can just carry on living my life the way I am. Don't you think like, uh, your, even your personal experience, don't you think like sometimes the clothing you wear has an effect on your reactions and your your do, your dealings? 100%. I've, I've actually come from previously the corporate world where, for example, I was wearing a, a monkey suit, as you would call it. And it affects the way you think. Mm. It affects the way you, your action affects the way you move. Even the, an act of worship like the Salah, for example, in the masjid, Wearing it in a suit is not the same feeling as wearing it as, as doing it in a thobe. Yeah, yeah. I just it's hard to put your finger on it, but there's true, a, a profound effect between the clothing you wear. Yeah, you know. And I suppose this is why the Sharia places such a huge importance yeah, on know. it. The clothing you wear and the actions and even your mindset. I yeah, you know. I'm not gonna lie, even me personally, when I'm driving and you know, I've got my imama on, I've got my hat on my head, I've got my thobe on, and it's visible and a car cuts me. I'm calm, no problem, brother. Take care. Make sure you watch next time. Mm -hmm. Honestly, and I'm not the type to get angry anyways. Mm -hmm. I don't have this road rage that people have and they get angry and they just talk yeah. people. Generally, I don't even have that asana. They cut me as just, you know, <laughs> you might cut someone else and they might do something to you. Yeah. But the way I react, I might not be happy with what this person does, but I never respond and never vulgar, of course. Mm. But I act more sensible because I know I'm, 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 sure. I'm, 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 I'm resembling something, and I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm what the, I have to hold uphold what the Prophet sallallahu would have done in this situation. What would he have done, Ali sallam? And I know a brother, Subhanallah, a group of brothers actually, to be honest. Uh, they said to me that when they're in the roads and they they get road rage, they get angry. They like whenever we want to get at this person and insult them, we take off our hat, we <sighs> follow on the front seat, yeah. and we start saying things. And then when we when he leaves, we put a hat on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, SubhanAllah, I remember SubhanAllah Here, UAE I basically was driving And I uh, had uh, got lost so, and You know, this country The, the signs are a bit sometimes yeah, hard yeah. <clears throat> So the sign up said Turn right, turn right I was like, oh no I looked uh, I just had And I cut the front car yeah. So he got angry Really uh, took it personal So he He came He cut me oh. And he braked right in front of me You know yeah. So for me it's I did it to you You did it to me But then He came to We came to the traffic light He got out of the car He got angry Came to the window very angry, he was very angry. Because he what made him even more angry is because I smiled. Oh, and I was only I smiling like as in like, don't worry about it, we're so good. Like, so good. You know, to be you polite, did, you, you, yeah, yeah, you did to me. But he thought you were laughing at him or something, maybe. So he came in the window and he said to me, as soon as he saw me, and he saw my thobe, he saw my imama, he saw, you know, he said, You're a practicing brother, man. Oh. Why are you doing? And I said, Oh brother, I'm using a stand up. I don't know the city. Mm. I caught you, you did it to me. And I smiled because you got me back. I have no rights to get angry. 
But look how it is. Clothing makes people say you have to uphold a particular. Do you understand my point? Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. I know. I know. But like people in the UK, for example, it's not just limited to clothing. It's even the beard, for example, it will actually stop you from committing sins. Yeah, it does. There might be people who would normally, <coughs> before they grow their beard, they might be thinking about going to the club, for example. Mm. You'd never dare walk into a club with a beard. It's just you know that I don't belong in here. It's just all the Barbie will not go to a club. Yeah, so true. Yeah. Well, that it is. <coughs> All these acts, the outer appearance that we have as Muslims, we have to understand it's, it's to actually tell us in advance what we're going to fall short in. I know a sister who fell off. I asked her a question. I said, she came to the, you know, help me. I am problems. Okay, first question. What was the first thing that happened before you, yeah, and you started listening to music, you started doing this, started this. what was first? She said, I, I took off my hijab. Mm. It is a hijab, not physically, but it's also a spiritual hijab. It mm. conceals all these problems from you. The woman, she takes off her niqab, just the niqab that she takes off. Then the jilbab comes, then it becomes a khimar. Then sometimes the hair is showing. And sometimes this is not. The point I'm trying to come to is the outer appearance has a strong effect on the heart. Definitely. That's why the Arabs they say, every vessel will swear what's inside it. So the body, you know a person. That's why when we say bil-i'tiqad, we wouldn't know that. Yeah, it's internal, isn't it? The scholars they say when you imitate the non-Muslims, you don't have to intend to imitate them. Ah. No one no one conditions that. I'm a, the strongest opinion is that you don't condition that. Mujarrad al mushabaha, just the mere. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that the, do not pray at the time when the sun rises. What's the reason? Because there are a group of people who are worshiping Shaitan, right? You're not intending to be like them. You're not trying to be like them. You're just trying to worship Allah. You're doing it. You're worshiping Allah. They're worshiping Shaitan, but you look the same. You're doing it at this time. They're doing it at this time. Yeah. Stay away from it. Yeah, I see. I so see. Shaykh Al Sam emphasize on this point. So some people will say, Akhi, I didn't even, you know, know the Christians were doing this. No problem. No sin on you. Alhamdulillah. But now that you know, you have to stay away from it. Okay, that actually brings me on to the next uh, part of the podcast, which I just want to move on to some closing questions now before we finish the podcast, inshallah. And you mentioned there's something very profound that even if they don't intend to imitate the disbelievers, it's just that they happen to be doing it at the same time or the yeah, same place. Yeah. Um, that A lot of people ask the question during Christmas, everybody's off work, everybody's off school. Is it allowed for us just on the same day because of organization purposes, just bring the family around, everyone's free and just have a dinner at the same, you know, Christmas day dinner. For, like for, They don't call it that, but they just want to have a dinner on that day because no, everyone's no, available. Not allowed to. Even know. though everyone's available, it just happens the to be The Prophet right. Sallallahu Alaihi when the man said, Ya Rasulullah, I made a nether, I made a covenant to slaughter. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, was this place a place where the people used to slaughter something? He said, La Ya Rasulullah, no. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi asked him, he said, if that's not the case, I mean, if, that's, if that is the case, that you know, alhamdulillah, no one is slaughtered here and it's not a specific, then the Prophet said, fulfill your covenant that you made, the oath that you made. So the Prophet asked him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so um, sahabas, they, they were new to Islam, Muslims, new Muslims. Mm. They, were, they didn't know, they were new Muslims. Hadith Abi Waqid in Ilayti, radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, marfu'an. The Prophet said to him, subhanallahi, Muhammad I'm another wording it said uh, make for us ilah the way that they have ilah that's what they said no they they just said it was that to anwat they, it's a tree, right? they just wanted the sorry they didn't actually say that they only said that ya rasulullah we just want a tree to you know, put our weapons on there and, you know, but find barakah from it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Subhanallah. And they knew Muslims. He said, Kama qala ban mu, ka, ka, kama qala Musa. This is exactly what the people of Musa said. Ij'al lana ilahan kama lahum aliha. Then the Prophet said, Walladhi nafsi biyadihi la tarkabunna sunnata man kana qablakum. You will follow the path of those who came before you. Mm. The love of Tirmidhi says, Okay, but that was the love of Tirmidhi. The love of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah mentions, "Qultum waladi nafsi biyadhi kama qala qawmu Musa." Wallahi, you guys have said exactly what the people of Musa said, which is what "Ij'al lana ilahan kama lahum aliha in lakum qawmu tajhalun." 
And then the Prophet said, إِنَّهَا السُنَنْ لَتَرْكَبُنَّ السُنَنَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ سُنَّةً سُنَّةً So these Sahabas, what they said, they didn't intend إِجْعَلْ لَنَا إِلَاهَمْ كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهَةً That wasn't their intent. That wasn't what they, what they intended. They just intended to... The hadith, by the way, Abdul Razak ibn Hamam Sanari authenticated it. Humaydiyu authenticated it in his Musnad. And he narrated it there. Tirmidhi also narrated kitab in his Kitab al-Fitan. Ibn Hibban al-Tabarani fil Mu'jam al-Kabir. Ibn Jarir and Ibn al-Kathir. Both of them in their tafsir. All of them through the authentic chain of Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri and Sinan ibn Abi Sinan. Du'ali, you can say it. Or Ad-Dili, both of ways you can you can pronounce it, no problem. And Abi Waqid in al-Layti, radiyallahu anhu. So it's authentic. Mm. The first one is Zuhri, Muhammad ibn Shihab. Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Ubaidullah ibn, Mus- ibn Shihab ibn Abdullah al-Qurashi ibn Zuhri. He's fine. Sinan ibn Abi Sinan is a daily, al-Madani thiqa. Waqid al is a Sahabi Jalil. So these Sahabas were not intended in any way, shape, or form mm-hmm. to follow the non-Muslims in that particular statement. Yeah, yeah, I see. Um, I'm just asking these questions. I know they're very common for people. Uh, um, uh, what about the next day? There's a Boxing Day, you know, the 26th of December. Again, it's a public holiday in the UK. It's not Christmas Day. If people want to just gather with their family, they're so allowed to do It's not any day that they have a celebration, they have a gathering. Mm-hmm. From the Zahir, you're not allowed to implement it. Don't do it. Make it a week later. Or make it a week earlier. Okay. If you have a family gathering you want to do. Okay. If somebody says Happy New Year to you, can you say you No, two? you don't. We don't say anything. We don't like say anything like that. What if are you allowed to have New Year's resolutions? No, we don't have any of that. Muslims have a, should have a daily resolution. Where He said, Account yourself every day. Scale your deeds every day. Question yourself every day. Allah says, Ya Ladina Amanu Takullah wal Tandu Nafsu Makadamat Ligadin, what takullah. Every day we should question ourselves and interrogate ourselves and think about the day. Every day we have to ask ourselves these questions before we go to bed. What have we done today? Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, when he saw a man who entered the Prophet's masjid three times and the Prophet said, anyone who enters that door is Ahl Jannah. And again, the man entered and then the man entered. And then three times the Prophet said that, alayhi salatu wasalam. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As said, I want to go to this man and see what it is that made him from the people of Jannah. And Abdullah ibn Amr asked when he went to his house and sl- stayed with him, he asked the man, hey, what is it that you do? I looked at you, I looked at your ibadah, I saw nothing special about you. Mm. He said, I, before I go to sleep at night, I just get rid of any animosity or hate or rage I have for any Muslim. I clean my heart. The point is, he accounted himself every day. True, yeah. I see. Yeah. I was wondering where you go with the hadith, but yeah, yeah. I like it. <coughs> okay, last question for me then, and then I'll give you an opportunity to summarize what we've discussed today. Um, how do you respond to someone who's saying you're making things extremely difficult on the people right now by having this kind of approach, and you're also making Islam a very reactive religion? Some people might be just have a leisure activity. Suddenly, the, the non-Muslims make it specific for them. We can't do it. Oh, this thing, we can't do that. We can't do that. It's a, such a reactive religion and it makes things extremely difficult in the dunya. Islam said this way before all of these people came up with these things. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, it wasn't Europe celebrating Christmas at that time. Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And it wasn't like that. So we have to understand this is, um, these celebrations that we see are not only taking place in the lands of the non-Muslims, but it's also taking place in the lands of some Muslims. So we also have to respond to it. We have to give a ruling in all these matters. Last but not least, I kind of dealt with this issue in a series that I'm doing, the contradictions, the apparent contradiction that people come with. People tend to say that religion is complicated, it's given too much rules and regulations. But then when that same person goes to a, a pharmacist or goes to a doctor and a doctor prescribes a medicine for you, that doctor tells you, take this much medicine, take, take this much dose, take it this particular time, Eat it, you know, take it with an empty stomach and etc. You adhere. And I promise you, that's for me personally, that's so much rules and regulations. <laughs> like I have to on one tablet, yeah. And it's this time, and it's, yeah. it's this red one you take. <laughs> and the white one, you don't take it. Hey, you take that one in the morning. Okay. And the way they scribble on the paper is it's unclear for me to even understand. So I have to keep You have that problem uh, Sometimes yeah I have to call right. back in and Sometimes I go back in And I say what, what, I don't know What I need to do here uh, It's too much rules And regulations for me personally But I don't look at the doctor And say hey listen Doctor, doctor, doctor mm. You're just trying to make Life hard for the people Just give us one medicine That does everything Why all this Unnecessary mm. stuff I see. That It doesn't work like that Nothing That's works true. like that 
one powerful statement I came across, which is, it's, just, it's the apparent contradiction of many of us. You fly to the UK, you fly to you know UAE, you come here, you go on a flight. Do you know the pilot? No. Do you know who he is? No idea. His profession, like his, his experience, no. what he knows, whether he's drunk or not. You no, don't, no idea. You, don't, you trust Emirates to make sure that you land safely mm. In Heathrow Airport. After trusting Allah, yeah. After Allah, you 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 put your trust in in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala awalan. And then after that you believe that they're gonna do a good job, right? Yeah. Without knowing the guy though. Correct, yeah. Or it could be a woman as yeah, well. Yeah. You don't know who's and he, he explains himself to us like like we're gonna know who he is anyways. <laughs> yeah. The point I'm trying to say is that we still trust them. And you can't trust your ulama, mm. you can't trust the companions, you can't trust the Prophet. Alayhi salatu salam. You can't trust the Quran. Mm. And that's a clear cut contradiction here. Jazakallah uh, khairan. Let's just close out the podcast with if you want a summary of what we've discussed today. Um, I'm My summary on this argument is that the tachabu of the kuffar is two types. There's a tachabu which is al manhiyu anu is prohibited. And I mentioned four. You can go back to the podcast to watch it inshallah ta'ala. And then I mentioned which is mubah is permitted. And I gave conditions for those which are pro, yani, the, those which are allowed, it, if it can't be religious re, religious issues, it can only be worldly issues, and even worldly issues, I gave conditions. Mm. I mentioned few conditions, six or seven conditions. Also, what I said is that generally speaking, the prophets of Allah, like Nuh alayhi salam, what alayhim laba Nuh and idqala li qomi inni idqala li qomi in kana kabur alaykum maqami wa tadkiri bi ayatillah fa ala Allahi tawakkal tu fajmi wa amrakum ila akhir ala ayat Nuh alayhi salam free him. Yeah, Free, free him from himself from his people. Ibrahim saying to his people, "Id qala Musa li qawid qala Ibrahim li qomi ya qomi inni wa id qala Ibrahim li wa id qala Ibrahim li qomi inna ni baraum min ma taabudun." When Ibrahim said to his people, "I am free from what you guys are doing," prophets did that; they freed themselves. So try your best as a Muslim to live as a Muslim. This issue of tashabbu is really, really, yeah, I mean, uh, I used to only think at the beginning, Wallahi, I, when I was young, I used to think, oh, it's a topic that needs to be spoken about, and inshallah ta'ala, that's it. Don't don't press on it too much. Mm. Until I saw when the uh, when the COVID issue happened, where people were dying, where people were like, are they Muslims, are they not? Ah, oh, right. Because yeah, of they can't tell, yeah. You can't. There's no science, there's no alamad. Somebody's like, I think he was a Muslim because he was assimilated with the non-Muslims, dressed like them, talked. Look how many things you lose out. When I see a brother with a lehi and a thawb in the street, look, what, what, what does he get from me? Assalamu alaikum, at the very least. At least that's a reward. And then, and on top of that, I might make dua for him. Akhi, may Allah bless you. The other day, I'll tell you something. My daughter, wallahi, my daughter was wearing, you know, they wear jilbabs, right? Yeah. Daughters, small daughters. We've tailor-made jilbabs for each one of them. Okay. A man came walking to us. And he grabbed me in a in a you know aggressive way, and I looked and I thought, this guy is he going to do something to me? And uh, he said to me, brother, I just want to say, Jazakallah khairan, may Allah bless you, man. I might do eyes with you. And I was like, what, what happened? Well, what did I do? He goes, I just saw your daughter. Wow. You know, Allah is your rare, we're rare people, and he showed me his daughter. I was like, oh, Allah. Allah. <laughs> you know, he made to have me just clothing, just the clothing of my daughter, yeah. the yeah. That's it. That's where the dua came from. So I was thinking all through the time, I was thinking, subhanAllah, I got a reward just by the clothing uh, that my daughter was wearing. Mm. So I'm saying to you, you miss out on these things. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you miss out on things that Muslims would do for you, you know, and some benefits that will come to you from it because we're, we're out here for each other. We're here to take care of one another. We're here to support one another. You know, I remember subhanAllah, it was a rainy day. It was a rainy day. In London, I was driving and I saw a Muslim man standing in the rain. I'm not going to let that happen. I pulled over. But how did I know he was a Muslim? Mm -hmm. So this brother, I, I picked him up and I drove him to wherever he wanted. It was actually a really far place. I actually had to drive way out of my, my, my way. But I, a brother, wear sogging, you know, so, soaking, sorry. Yeah. It was like, I need to help you. So it, it, I wouldn't do that for 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 a non for a non Muslim. I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of trust issues and things like that. Yeah. So my point is that when you're wearing Islamic clothing, even before the ajr and the khayr that comes with it, but the worldly benefits that you get from it, assalamu alaikum, the brotherly love, the the many many issues that come with it, 
It's so true. And, and we talked in detail earlier on the podcast about how it even impacts your mind and your actions and your thought process, which is uh, really profound. There was one last final story I want to mention. There was a brother, half of the Kitab Allah Azza wa Jalla, Qari, Muqri, Mashallah, Mutqin in Uloom Shara'iya, he's very good at it. And it was actually the first time he said to me, I actually wore a non Islamic clothing. Again, I don't want to say non Islamic clothing because there are some, like, it's hard to say that. But yeah. the point is, like, he was wearing yani, jeans and, and he was wearing that because he had to do something. Mm. So he came into the masjid and the Imam and the Khatib didn't come. And so they asked, him, Can somebody really do the Khutbah al Jumu'ah? And he said, I couldn't. Uh, Just because of what I was wearing. Yeah. So even prevents you from some khair and good sure. and a lot of things, you know. Like, w- would you want somebody who's wearing jeans to lead the people's salah mm-hmm. and jama'ah and everything like that? I wouldn't want to pray behind them who's wearing jeans personally, mm-hmm. I'll be honest with you. Mm-hmm. So Obviously not saying it's halam to pray behind No, them, I'm not saying I'm not it's saying It's just that. your personal preference. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Because yeah. I know this position was occupied by the Prophet ﷺ and it has to be a certain type of dressing. Mm-hmm. Um, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be um, like the righteous people Because we Ameen. can't be like them The poet says إن We can't be like Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, and Ali But at least we will imitate them mm-hmm. We want to talk like them Be like them For very imitating the righteous people Itself is a virtue Itself is a virtue Jazakallah khairan I know it's been another long one I really appreciate your time Barakallah feekum Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk